Um, so today, um, we will have CEUs available for pest management and, as well as crop management. And um, as always, I am on the CCA board and we appreciate the opportunity to partner with the CCA program to offer CEUs. Uh, today, we have a total of three presentations. We will have a coffee break at 10.15. Uh, we will also have a, I hope you're hungry, a, a big lunch available for you as well. Um, at the conclusion of today's program. And again, uh, the t-shirts, if you see anybody with the rooted in t-shirts, ask questions if you have them. Now, our first presenter this morning is Dr. Carla Gage. She's Associate Professor of Weed Science and Plant Biology in Schools of Agricultural Sciences and Biological Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. She completed her bachelor and master's degree in biology at the University of Memphis and a PhD in plant biology with a focus on weed ecology at SIUC. Dr. Gage joined the facility at SIUC in 2015 and enjoys teaching and research in applied management of agricultural systems. Dr. Gage's research focuses on weed control in Midwestern U.S. cropping systems and the rotational crops of corn, soybean, wheat, sorghum, and industrial hemp. She has 22 published papers, three book chapters, and has authored and co-authored 69 conference proceedings. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Carla Gage. So thanks so much for that introduction, Stephanie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today, to give you an update on some of the things we've been doing lately. I also have some resources here for you if you want to pick them up. If you need more posters for your wall, uh, I have a weed management planner. So what you do before planting. I have a summary of the herbicide modes of action, if uh, that information is a little rusty. And then I also have a new take action chart with the products and how they're classified. So feel free to come pick these things up. Um, I'll leave them at the, at the front here. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about... Uh, ah, I should turn it on. Okay, there. Okay, so I'm going to give you an update on some of the resistances that we're finding, and then I'm going to talk to you about management tools. So I'm going to start with putting everything into an integrated weed management framework, and then we're going to talk about the value of a pre, uh, what rainfall events do to pre-efficacies, and then uh, I'll tell you about a, one of the large-scale projects that we're doing on cover crops and planting green. Um, and then I'll end talking just a little bit about some of the new technology and some of the things that we're seeing come out. So to talk about a resistance update, I'll give you an overview, and then I'll talk about water hemp and giant ragweed. I show this graph every single time I present, so you've probably seen this before. Uh, this is the increase in unique herbicide-resistant cases globally. This is all systems. It's not just agricultural systems, but there are 522 unique, species, unique cases with 269 species right now. Uh, we know that weeds have evolved resistances to 21 of the 31 known herbicide sites of action and to 165 different herbicides, and this curve is not leveling off. This just shows you the amount of pressure that we're putting on herbicides to accomplish all the weed management work. The more pressure we put on the herbicides, the more, uh, more we're going to see these resistance cases rise, really. So we've got to diversify our programs, and that's going to mean more than just diversifying sites of action that you put into the field. And these are the resistances in Illinois right now. So Palmer amaranth has three documented resistances. Water hemp, of course, we know is our, is our main driver weed here. Um, and you can see all the resistances listed there, but we also have common ragweed, giant ragweed, common lamb's quarters, mare's tail, kochia, uh, giant foxtail, eastern black nightshade, shatter cane, and cockleburr that we have to manage resistances for. 
So we've looked specifically at um, a, a lot at water hemp recently. Uh, we're involved in, a, in another large scale study funded by the United Soybean Board where we go out and collect escapes in fields. Uh, we're looking for specific patterns and, and you should do this too. So when you see that clump of plants in the middle of the field, everything else is clean, but you see a clump. It's like a, a discrete dis dispersion, right? So, so you're looking for that pattern and that tells you that there was a mother plant that escaped control, likely due to resistance, and those seeds are now spreading out from that mother plant. So that's your first indication that there's a problem. And you should also look in the areas where um, equipment enters the field, so the, the, the entries to your field. And that's where you're gonna find a lot of the seed moves in and you may have resistances moving in with it. So we're looking for these patterns when we're looking for escapes. So we're picking suspect resistance pop resistant populations and we're sending these out to our university, other university collaborators for a screen that is just a discriminating dose. They spray these suspected resistant populations with a half rate and a full rate, and then they look at the survivors, and they give us back the data. And then we have been taking those accessions, those seeds, and we've been running what we call dose response curves, where we expose them to at least six doses of herbicide, and we try to accurately measure the level of resistance in that population. So, um, so this is what we've done. We collect from September through October. We put these in a greenhouse. Uh, we spray them uh, with a number of different doses of 2,4-D, dicamba, and glufosinate. So those are the, the posts that we're targeting. Um, and then we collect the biomass, dry it, and weigh it, and uh, develop our curves. So what we've, what we've found is that this is for uh, 2,4-D. We have one population in particular out of all the ones that we've screened that is incredibly problematic. Um, and you can see these, these are ED50s. This is the, the, the y-axis on that graph is the effective dose that kills 50% of the population. The dashed line is the 1x rate of 2,4-D. So you can see population seven in particular is a resistant population. And on the right, you see photos of that population at different doses, and you can see that it has survived up to a 4x rate of 2,4-D. So uh, we've also looked at dicamba, and we're not seeing, so what we thought were suspect populations for dicamba, they are not, at least so far, the ones that we're screening, and we continue to screen these populations. So as of now, uh, no documented resistances in those populations to dicamba. Uh, but we're seeing some issues with glufosinate. And you'll notice uh, it's population seven again, and population one, uh, their effective doses are exceeding that 1x rate. Um, on the right, you see photos of population one, and we do have survivors at the 4x rate of glufosinate. So within the same population, population seven, we have multiple resistance to 2,4-D and glufosinate. So that's work that's ongoing. Um, so we, the, the ED50 values, they, they follow the visual ratings that we're seeing. So everything, our data looks, the ED50s match the visual ratings. Um, so we are continuing, we're ongoing uh, to screen these populations for more active ingredients. Uh, that, those populations that we confirm resistance in, we will take those and we will characterize them, meaning that we'll spray them with other active ingredients that could be suspect or could be possibly linked to those resistances. For example, uh, 2,4-D resistance has been linked to the resistance of HPPD inhibiting herbicides in the literature. So we will take that 2,4-D resistant population and we will screen it for HPPD active ingredients to see if it's also resistant to those. And that brings me to metabolic resistance. So that linkage, because those plants are able to break down 2,4-D, they have the mechanism to also break down HPPDs. That's metabolic resistance. Uh, that's something that other people are working out, but we know that um, we're seeing more metabolic resistances. And, uh, and this is just resistance mechanisms in Illinois. Target site resistances, those are mutations in an enzyme that cause the herbicide to not bind as well to that enzyme and reduce its effectiveness. Target site or non-target site resistances, those metabolic resistances, the plant just breaks down the herbicide. It tags it and then targets it and breaks down that molecule and it's, it's no longer active. 
So uh, we, we're, we have, a, as you can see, a list of, of those resistances that have been documented. And just to remind you, this is, this is how we get uh, crop selectivity. So crops do this, especially corn. Corn's very good about breaking down the herbicides that are labeled to be applied on corn. Um, this is for atrazine. You can see corn within six hours metabolizes 96% of the atrazine it's exposed to. Oats, on the other hand, metabolizes 2%, and that's why oats are so sensitive. So this is something that, that plants do, and it's something that weeds are evolving to be able to do the more that we expose them to, to herbicides. And I'm telling you to use multiple effective sites of action, and that is still the best recommendation that we have. You put multiple active ingredients in the tank to control your problematic weeds, and um, that can also put selection pressure on plants. So the more you expose them to, you may be pushing them more towards that metabolic resistance where they're able to break down multiple active ingredients. So it's still the best recommendation we have for long-term sustainability of cropping systems. Um, but we also need to, to do other things, right, so that we don't rely quite as much on herbicides. And that's where integrated weed management comes in. I'll talk to you more about that. We also have been documenting this, uh, this population of giant ragweed. Um, we have a, a population that is, uh, we, we already know we have resistance to the ALS inhibitor, Site of Action 2 in Illinois. That's, that's been present for a very long time. Um, classic and Pursuit are the documented uh, products with resistances. But um, we have not documented glyphosate resistance yet in Illinois. We know that it's present. It's present in all the states around us. It just simply has not been documented. So we're going through the process of running the dose response curves again to actually get this documented um, on weedscience.org, which is the website that most people go to to look for resistance information. Uh, so we have a giant ragweed that can survive up to a 2x rate of glyphosate, um, at least the populations that we're looking at. And then uh, we're also seeing problems with femesifen. Uh, so the PPO inhibitors, uh, femesifen has, has never been just great on giant ragweed, but uh, it has been, I mean, 85 to 90% control or even a little more uh, has been documented for our, um, our susceptible populations. And now we're seeing, for this particular population, a shift over time. So it is really, it's, it's selection for resistance that's happening gradually. Um, and we're in the process of running more PPO inhibiting herbicides, again, expanding this screen to understand fully what we're dealing with. Uh, we know that the University of Wisconsin has documented PPO inhibitor resistance in giant ragweed. That's happened relatively recently. And uh, working with Pat Trannell at the University of Illinois, we believe that we have a different mechanism of resistance than what the University of Wisconsin has found. So two independent evolutionary events to evolution to PPO inhibiting herbicides in giant ragweed. So that brings me to integrated weed management, right? I've told you we're putting so much pressure on our herbicides. We have to diversify. Diversifying site of action groups is, is probably not going to be enough. We have to do other things. So the role of integrated weed management is to work with chemical control to increase the different types of control practices that you put into your program. If this is done um, effectively, it can slow the, rev the evolution of herbicide resistance and prolong the efficacy of our biotechnological traits and our herbicide active ingredients. So think of it as, uh, as, I don't know if you know, the farm manager, Ronnie Krauss at Belleville, who was the farm manager for many years, he would talk about this as thinning the herd. <laughs> so you reduce the number of plants that are exposed to the herbicides that you're applying, through different practices, and that reduces the probability that you're gonna select for herbicide resistance. So integrated weed management is the combination of all these tactics to um, protect our technologies and protect the efficacy of our weed control systems. So we combine chemical control with other management tactics. For mechanical, we could think of that as harvest weed seed control practices. Uh, chemical, of course, we diversify herbicides and uh, we have our genetically modified crop systems that we work with. Uh, for cultural, we could look at diversified rotations, and that's where our lab's research with hemp is coming in to try to diversify our crop rotations and see if there's another commodity that we can put in rotation. Uh, but you could also use narrow row spacing, uh, cover crops, of course, which I'll talk about today, and then interseeded crops. 
And biological controls, we don't have a lot of those available to us, but the crickets that you see in your field and those little black beetles, the carabid ground beetles that you see in the field, they can eat a lot of weed seeds. If their populations are high enough, they could potentially eat 85% of the amaranthus seeds that are in your field. So there are other things that we can do and rely on. Um, and then, of course, this is all on a platform of prevention. We want to prevent those seeds from getting there in the first place, if possible. So now the value of a pre. Um, I'm really proud to be part of this project. So um, this was led by Chris Landau um, at the, um, the USDA AR ARS um, out of the University of Illinois, working with, um, with Marty Williams. So I counted 26 authors on this publication, and the title of it is The Silver Bullet That Wasn't, Rapid Agronomic Weed Adaptations to, glyph to Glyphosate in North America. Basically what we did was we took all of our historical data from all of our research programs and we gave it to Chris. And he compiled it and has been running the, running the data to look for trends over all this historical data. It's, very, it's a very powerful data set that he can now analyze. So we have 11 locations, an incredible amount of data uh, that spans from 1976 to, to 2022. So we have corn and soybean trials treated with uh, at least one glyphosate application, and then he's been looking at percent weed control. So he's, for now, he hasn't really done a lot with the data, but, but this one thing that he's done that's, that's impressive, uh, he's looked at two subsets. So he's looked at trials with glyphosate only, and then trials that, were, that included a pre near planting followed by glyphosate. And, uh, and he selected the rates that he wanted to look at. And for each weed species by location, he looked at the efficacy over time, so our ratings of the effectiveness, and he looked at the variability of that control over time. So, so what he found, um, you see control on the y-axis there, the percent control uh, by year. So over time with glyphosate alone, we're seeing the control efficacy decrease. That's not big news, right? Every you would expect that, of course, with the evolution of resistance. But when we add a pre followed by glyphosate, we don't see the control, the percent control decrease. Uh, we actually see the, the combined effects are increasing. Some of the individual sites are, um, are staying the same over time. So we're seeing pre's preserve the effectiveness of that post-emergence chemistry. And the same thing with the variability. So the variability of control has been much greater with glyphosate alone, meaning that some of those populations probably evolved resistance, some relatively quickly. The control was, uh, was much more variable with glyphosate alone. But when you add a pre, the variability in that control actually decreases. So you get more predictable efficacy. And of course, this is just with glyphosate, and everyone knows that you know glyphosate, while it still does have utility, pretty great utility, we have resistance problems that do not allow us to, to look at glyphosate alone anymore. So, um, so we saw that the control and, uh, and very, control decreased and variability increased over time when glyphosate was used alone. Um, providing or adding a pre to the tank um, can preserve the efficacy and reduce the variability in, in glyphosate, but this can be applied to all of our other chemistries as well. So, so pre's are important to preserve the efficacy of, of what we're doing here. And uh, just as an aside, he's also looking at the effect of weather on our post herbicide efficacies, which um, again, it's such a powerful data set. Um, he here has looked at on the y-axis the average temperature 10 days before application, uh, and then the total rainfall you see along the, the x-axis there. And then the colors that you see are the probability of successful control uh, one being full control, and zero, or the yellow being no control. So as, uh, as temperature, with low temperatures and an increase in rainfall, uh, we see water hemp efficacy dramatically decrease. And then uh, same rainfall after application, we see with higher temperatures and higher amounts of rainfall, we have dramatic decreases in efficacy of water hemp. So these are the types of things he's going to be looking at as he mines the data. Uh, so just in summary, increased rainfall and higher temperature after application led to reduced control. 
Um, we will see climate shifts. Uh, so as global temperatures continue to rise and rainfall becomes more variable, um, our ability to consistently control these and other common and troublesome weeds is at risk. So we should understand uh, these relationship patterns, um, even though we can't control the weather, right, we can at least predict what the outcome of our management actions may be. So uh, now looking at extreme rainfall events, I just wanted to share with you a project that we just completed. Um, and again, this goes back to the, uh, again, the importance of uh, soil residual herbicides. So those pre's are key management tools to fight herbicide resistant weeds. Um, we have weeds with extended emergence patterns. Palmer amaranth and water hemp both have extended emergences. Um, I wanted to put this graph back up. This is, this is old data from 2015, actually, looking at uh, the density over time, or the, the seed density per meter square of Palmer amaranth um, over time from May 12th to uh, beyond September 29th there. But we have uh, these different treatments. Two of those that you see close together are tillage treatments, and the red on top there is no-till. Um, our average pre-application timing occurs when there's already some emergence of Palmer amaranth. So there'd already be some plants emerged in the field, possibly at the time that you're applying that pre. And then, of course, at the time that our post is applied, we still have that emergence curve that's continuing after that post-emergence application. So if you don't put in a residual with your post, you're going to have continued emergence of Palmer amaranth and, and water hemp at these times. Now, I also wanted to relate this back to the, the practice that we're seeing of, of people shifting their planting date of soybeans early, earlier and earlier, right? So the earlier you plant, the less time in the season you're gonna get on your pre-emergence herbicide. So what are you gonna do 21 days after your pre-application when it's no longer effective? You need to come in with a post. Hopefully you're putting in another soil residual in that post but you still have this emergence pattern. So are you gonna go back with a second post application to maintain your weed control? And there are a lot of people that are working on this now to see how weed control fits into this early planting strategy. So uh, we have been looking at the efficacy of group 15 herbicides following severe rainfall events. So what happens when you don't get enough rain? And then what happens when you get too much rain? And what, what is too much rain? What are the limits here? So, uh, so we know that the climate change models are going to are going to are predicting um, higher rainfall in the spring in Illinois, followed by more extreme dry events. Um, we know that the Group 15s rely on incorporation, usually rainfall, to to be efficacious, and uh, and Group 15s are essential components. So there are overlapping soil residuals that are applied at that post application timing. So we wanted to look at the limits of rainfall on the Group 15s. We did this at the Agronomy Research Center in Carbondale, and we used esmetolachlor, which is dual magnum. We used acetochlor, which is encapsul or encapsulated in acetochlor, which is warrant, dimethenamid P, Outlook, and pyroxysulfone, or Zidua. And then we simulated rainfall events uh, in these different quantities, uh, 16 centimeters, 8 centimeters, 4 centimeters, 2 centimeters, or 1 centimeter. And we did this with irrigation. So we laid irrigation pipes, uh, we split the field into five irrigation application timings, and then we sprayed, um, we sprayed and then followed it with irrigation with these different rainfall amounts. Uh, so we had these application timings within a seven day period. Uh, we did this in July when we were not getting um, ambient rainfall. So all of our moisture that we applied in the field came from our irrigation timings. And this is just an example of what we found. So this is our uh, visual control ratings for common water hemp again. Um, so you can, you can just see for our four different pre-emergent herbicides that we looked at, we had dramatically different efficacies over these different rainfall amounts. Now, um, the top curve here, uh, this, this that doesn't show up. Uh, the, the black dashed line is encapsulated acetochlor or warrant. So it really didn't lose that much efficacy in, until beyond eight centimeters. So the encapsulation for water hemp uh, actually held its efficacy over time. Uh, the red dashed line is Zidua, uh, the green line is Dual 2 Magnum, and then the most sensitive one was Outlook or Dimethenamid P. Now, I tell you this to suggest 
that, you know, I know we can't control the rainfall amounts. We have no idea what the rainfall amounts are going to be when we go into the season. But it might be good to understand the, um, the interaction of the, the chemical that you're using with, with rainfall. So how sensitive is that chemical to degradation by rainfall? How, how easily is it going to be washed into the soil profile and deactivated? And then that'll kind of tell you more about what your timing should be as far as your next control measure. So um, when we look at the summary here, common water hemp uh, rated 28 days after application. Um, a rainfall event of four centimeters was enough to reduce the efficacy of esmetolachlor. 16 centimeters reduced acetochlor, two centimeters reduced dimethenamide P, and eight centimeters reduced pyroxysulfone. When we looked at the count data, so we counted the number of water hemp plants in each plot, we saw that acetochlor and pyroxysulfone uh, showed enhanced control compared to esmetolachlor and dimethenamide P, but rainfall events over four centimeters uh, caused a decrease in efficacy. So um, what we found was that the effect of rainfall was highly dependent on the chemical that you use. Um, acetochlor was, more, was better on common water hemp than on tall fescue. I didn't show you the data for tall fescue, uh, but dimethenamide P was better on tall fescue than water hemp with those rainfall amounts. So it's going to vary by species, of course. Um, and then because we saw the greatest level of control on tall fescue from acetochlor at, uh, at rainfall events between four and eight centimeters, we assume, we presume that the encapsulation uh, may have negatively impacted the ability of the herbicide to perform at low rainfall events. So it took more rainfall to see that efficacy on tall fescue. So um, in the future, we would like to do a direct comparison on the encapsulated versus non-encapsulated formulation of this product, which I think would kind of tease that out. And then overall, the data suggests that pyroxysulfone and acetochlor are more stable under high precipitation events than esmetolachlor and dimethamine P. So again, just another thing that's important to consider as you choose your soil applied herbicide. So now I want to tell you a little bit about a study that we're, we, we're involved in two very large scale studies looking at planting green. So the interaction of cover crops and termination timing and herbicides. Uh, this is one that I haven't presented yet. Uh, so this is, this is a, a new, I'm, I'm sharing this with you for the first time. Um, so if, when I say planting green, uh, just for audiences that, that don't understand what that is, um, you're, you're just planting soybeans into a standing living uh, cover crop biomass, and then you're terminating that after, uh, after planting at some point, um, a day or, or more after planting. So this is, uh, this is a project that's led out of Penn State. So John Wallace is the primary investigator on this, and this is his student, uh, Grant Hoffer's project. So I'm showing you data that Grant has assembled. This is a presentation that he's just recently given at a, at a regional conference. Um, the title was Delayed Serial Rye Termination Influences Weed Recruitment, a Regional Perspective. So, um, there's a lot of talk about planting green. It's definitely gaining interest because it can, uh, it, it can increase the biomass that's present in the field, which has soil health um, implications, as well as, of course, weed control implications. So the more biomass you have in the field for your cover crop, the better your weed suppression is going to be. So um, working through GROW, which is a network called, it's, the, it's, an, it's called Getting Rid of Weeds. Uh, so that's the acronym there. Uh, so it's all about outreach, and this is just one of the projects that, that GROW has set up. It's a, it's a huge group of, of scientists with lots of different projects. So we're looking to evaluate the effects of delayed cover crop termination on weed and crop management across a soil and environmental gradient. And you can see in blue the states that are involved there. So we want to inform these regional decision support tools. So we, we want to gather all the information so that we can better make decisions about how to manage cover crops in this plant and green scenario. That, in, that specifically is um, looking at uh, increases in cereal rye biomass production. So how do we increase biomass production? Um, broadleaf weed recruitment patterns at our post application timing. So what does that biomass do to broadleafs at post? Uh, we're looking at the efficacy of soil applied residual herbicides. So um, are the soil residuals working with that amount of biomass in the field? And then, of course, soybean yield. 
So we believe, or the hypothesis is, that planting green will increase weed suppression alone and in combination with soil applied herbicides, but the magnitude of this effect will vary based on the gains in cereal rye biomass that occur across production regions and driver weed species within production regions. So we, we each, at each of our sites, um, we set up a high biomass treatment and then a lower biomass treatment. So I have two fields each year of this study where I'm trying to get different levels of cereal, cereal rye biomass within our sites at Carbondale. Our main plots are um, cover crop, either no cover crop, which is the control, CTL. We have cereal rye, with a standard termination, um, 14 to 21 days pre-plant. So this is the 14 um, days pre-plant, DPP. And then we have the third one, uh, cereal rye, plant in green, uh, terminated one to three days post-plant, or one day after plant, one DA, DAP. And then we have these split plots where we look at either a post only, we don't apply a pre, or we have a two pass program with a pre followed by a post. And each of those main plot treatments, those cover crop treatments are split with those herbicide treatments. And then we used um, Enlist One um, and our pre was Fierce XLT. So we collected cover crop biomass prior to termination. We looked at the weed density by species, collected 28 days after planting in two meter quadrats, uh, two meter square quadrats. And uh, soybean yield data was collected. Uh, we then did a weed density analysis grant. I say we, uh, Grant did a weed density analysis using the relative response index. So I won't really go through that, that equation really, but I will show you the, um, the data. And this is what we're doing. So this is the whole, the framework of the entire project here. So we're looking at cover crop management strategies, uh, specifically cover crop residue mass. And then we have our cover crop management legacies, our soil percent uh, volum volumetric water content. We're looking at soil temperature effects and then soil nitrogen pool effects. And nitrogen pool goes back to how we're trying to drive differences in biomass. So we have a high nitrogen field that should get high cereal rye biomass and a low nitrogen field to drive the lower biomass that we're looking at. And then we're looking at the weed management legacies, so um, the, the propagule pressure, the amount of seeds that are emerging, and then species traits, seed size, of course, is a component here. We expect the smaller seeded broadleafs to be better suppressed by cereal rye biomass than the larger seeded ones. Larger seeded weeds should have more energy, uh, more ability to push through biomass layers, so we're looking for that distinction in our data. So I want to focus on the, the graphs on the left, and that's just cereal rye biomass at termination. And you can see just the color coding is all the different states. Um, in, in general, the longer the termination window, the more cereal rye biomass you get. That is in mostly in the high biomass treatment, so where we had higher nitrogen in our fields at, at planting, we see higher cereal rye biomass. Uh, when we have lower nitrogen in planting, the termination window does not matter as much um, across more sites. So we, we get less cereal rye biomass whether or not we, we terminate um, before or closer to planting. Um, and then we looked at the response of broadleaf weed species. So this is uh, just probably difficult for you to see, uh, relative responses of annual broadleaf weed species. Uh, so weed density at 28 days after planting. Uh, so we saw that weed suppression increased in um, our 14 day pre-plant termination timing in the control at seven out of 16 sites. So even uh, in, our, in our control treatment, we, got, we still got increased weed suppression at seven out of 16 sites. Uh, 14 DPP with the pre, uh, we had weed suppression at 13 out of 16 sites. So, so more, the pre added efficacy there. Uh, and this is again, termination at 14 days before planting. Um, at one day after plant, uh, in the control treatment with, with no pre, we had suppression at eight out of the 16 sites. And then when we added the pre, we had suppression at 14 out of the 16 sites. So there wasn't a ton of difference in this, uh, in this comparison, whether we terminated at 14 days prior to plant or one day after plant, as far as weed suppression goes. We uh, did not see significant yield differences either among those treatments. Um, 
there were two locations that showed patterns where yields were decreased um, in uh, Nebraska, a drier climate, or increased in southern Illinois when planting green relative to the control. This is a little different than our other large-scale project that we've, uh, we've looked at where uh, we see, you can see soybean stand counts on the y-axis by cereal or biomass. We see a decrease in soybean stand counts. Um, and then on the, the graph on the right, you see soybean yield um, by cereal or biomass. And we see a decrease in soybean yield on average with higher cereal or biomass. Now, you, there is a cluster of points, right? So that, this is a regression curve and all the points in the, the lower right of that graph are pulling it down. You see a good number of cluster, uh, clustered points up there where you have higher cereal rye biomass and it is not affecting soybean yield. But we know that the possibility is there. The more cover crop biomass you have, potentially you can see some impacts on yield. We saw it in one of our large scale studies and we did not see it in the other. So um, now that brings me to cultural and technological uh, practices. Just, just a, a hint you know, at, at current and future trends. Um, we're seeing much greater adoption of harvest weed seed control practices, and this is probably not a, a great option for everyone. But if you're having trouble with some fields where you have high levels of herbicide resistance, you're, you're, you really don't have a lot of other chemical tools left, this is an option. So if you do this over time, you're destroying the seeds that go back into the seed bank. And for these summer annual species, if you do not let them produce seeds, then you've effectively won the, the battle, we could say. So uh, this is a, a relatively new approach to tackle herbicide resistant weeds. Um, a lot of this technology is coming out of Australia. Australians have a very similar challenge when it comes to herbicide resistance, so there's been a lot of innovation. Uh, so the, the, I guess, trick to this would be to make this work, the weeds have to retain their seeds at harvest. We see a lot of seed shatter as the combine moves through the field. As soon as the header contacts that weed, seeds can shatter, and if they don't go into the combine, they can't be destroyed by these practices. So the, the weeds have to retain their seeds. We would predict over time, if we start relying on this type of technology, that we're gonna see weeds that evolve to shatter early. They're gonna mature earlier, they're gonna reproduce earlier, and they're gonna shatter easier. But for now, we see very high levels of efficacy for the amaranthus species. So if you have multiple resistant water hemp in your field, this is potentially an option. You can destroy the seeds before they go back to harvest or back to the field. There are a number of different practices, uh, six, six different ones in particular, that have come out of Australia. Um, some of them involve collecting the seeds and the chaff from the crop and taking them off site. That would be the chaff cart where you go dump that somewhere or you feed it to livestock. Um, narrow windrow burning is something we've looked at as well, where you funnel not only the chaff, the, the entire crop residue is funneled out the back of the combine in a huge line, and then you set it on fire and you destroy the seeds. And that can be effective as well, but of course then you have issues with, with open fire, with burning in the fields, and of course, especially in Australia in such a dry climate, that is probably not ideal. And then there's a bale direct system where the residue is just baled and taken off site. We have chaff lining, which is something that my lab is working with quite a bit. Um, it's one of the, the lower hanging fruits of harvest feed seed control. All you have to do is build a chute and fix it to the back of your combine. And you know that separates, you have to have some separation within your combine. So if you have an older combine model, this might be more challenging. But you line the chaff, so the, more, the most fine particulates of the crop out the back of the combine, and that's where the weed seeds go as well. The straw is spread back on the field. Uh, so you put the weed seeds in a line, in the same line, every year, every time you harvest. Over time, you can clear the surrounding area of 94% of the seeds, and this has been shown to happen within three to four years. You can isolate the seeds of the amaranthus species in this line. Now, it's not gonna look pretty, right? Because that's where your, all your amaranthus are gonna come up the next season. But you can go back and you can band applications on this line, and there's some pretty great work right now looking at the interaction of the chaff lines and soil residual herbicides in corn following soybeans. And you really get a longer window of control uh, when you combine those two practices again, chemical and chaff lining. 
Impact mills, again, this, these, are, these are now being built into combines. They destroy the seeds before they go back onto the field. Uh, they devitalize them by crushing the seed coat. And then chaff tram lining, it's the same thing as chaff lining, but you put the chaff lines out the back of the combine in the tire tracks so that you run over them every time you, you move in the field. So another form of control. Chaff lining in particular, though, that's something that, um, since it's a very, very low cost, um, I think that could be a, a realistic management strategy where we could band herbicide applications on the chaff line and improve control. And I just wanted to, this is almost the end here. I know I'm running out of time. This is, um, again, integrated weed management. So herbicides alone, and then herbicides plus harvest weed seed control. This work is from Michael Walsh, who's one of the leaders in harvest weed seed control technology out of Australia at the University of Sydney. Uh, so you see in the, the top line there, well, we have on the y-axis annual ryegrass plants per meter square, and then along the x-axis we have the year of these treatments. Uh, we see much greater efficacy when we combine the practices and use herbicides and harvest weed seed control together. The top line is herbicides only, so the bottom line is herbicides plus harvest weed seed control, and you can see that many fewer plants, annual ryegrass plants, uh, per meter square, and then by 2010 and 2011, you've effectively reduced that population to almost zero by using those practices together. Um, so we're also working in the digital space. Uh, my lab is supplying images to, again, the GROW network, and they're building image detection uh, systems that are open source that any company will be able to access and any grower will be able to use. So we're building this image repository of all the weeds that we have with our, within our collaborating states across the nation. And then we're, tr we're, we're providing this data set that will be available to train software programs. So if you're a startup company trying to get into this space, you don't have to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars obtaining the images. You have an image database to start with that you can work with. So uh, we're seeing a lot of movement with weed detection and control. Um, I mean, John Deere Sea and Spray is a great example of that, but there are so many others. Uh, so this is technology that we're going to continue to see improve. Um, I have a colleague that's, that's working on this. He's actually set up his own consulting company, and he estimates that there are over 250 different companies that are working in this space right now to develop autonomous uh, solutions for weed control. So we're going to see a lot of movement in the technological sector, which will, again, relieve some of the pressure on our herbicides. But it's all about using these things in combination. We can't just switch from, from one tool completely and adopt another. We have to make sure that we keep as many tools as possible available for our use. And we, try, we need to try to diversify and, uh, and move beyond just a chemical focus. So with that, uh, I thank you for your time. It was really great to be here today to talk to you all. I don't think I have any time for questions, do I? Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so we have worked with anywhere from 60 pounds an acre to 110 pounds, and you don't really see, I mean, over 100 pounds, you're not seeing any increase in weed suppression. Um, the going rate right now for most of our studies is around 60 pounds, so that lower rate. Um, and, uh, and I think that's pretty much the standard in most of the weed suppression publications that I'm looking at. Uh, so, so I do believe that was the seeding rate for, for all the data that I showed you. Um, we do drill it. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't work with, uh, with broadcasting it, right, because uh, that will reduce the establishment. So, so yeah, we've, we've been drilling what we've been using. If we, if we did broadcast, I would, I would want to up that rate for sure. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in because I, my, I had a question also related to the, to the cereal rye. So and maybe you mentioned this, but what would be the ideal amount of biomass that you should shoot for? I mean, if there's too much biomass, then it reduces the soybean yield. How much do you really need to get the benefits of the, for the weed control? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, um, a great um, question. 
I, I can't remember the, the ideal biomass amounts right now. I know that there are um, a number of publications that address that, and there are um, regression, regression lines that have been developed to try to look at that relationship, and I, I really can't give you an exact amount, but yeah. Most of our work has been in soybeans only. Yeah, um, so we don't, uh, partly because crop rotational studies are, are difficult to fund, right? Um, a lot of our uh, funding comes from the soybean board and we really try to focus on soybeans in those projects. Um, and then the funding for long-term projects that allow um, assessment of rotations is, is just limited. Most of the funding that my lab has um, has a three-year duration. And then the, um, re, the um, I should say, reinstatement of those projects for continued funding is, is never guaranteed. So rotational studies are hard for funding, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And we've really focused on soybeans. Yes, so um, there has been talk of that. Um, so is a, um, a demo trial to look at some of the, the most important um, herbicide programs in both corn and soybeans. These are our showcase trials, and they're always placed at the Belleville Research Center. So if you ever wanna see what the going trends are and what uh, you know each major company is promoting as far as their portfolios, um, you can pop into Belleville and, uh, and take a look at what we're doing there. And there's always somebody there to, to give you a tour. They can take you out to the field and, and show you the list of our treatments. We want to plant cover crops after those showcase trials and start collecting the data. There have been uh, discussions about how we can do this um, I think that would be a really important data set to have. Um, we have not been able to put together the resources to make that happen yet for, for many different reasons. We plant those trials late so that they can be shown at our field day, which is, you know, mid-July. So we can't plant at the normal planting time. We have to push that back a little bit so there'll be something to see. And then that means our harvest is later, which means we can't plant our cover crops in a timely manner unless we change the way that we do things there. But that is something that I really wanna see because that would give us a really great look for, for all the major programs that people are recommending. How is that affecting our different species of cover crops that we're trying to plant? So yeah, that's, that's something we wanna do but haven't. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gage. Um, I also want to reiterate, uh, not only am I on the CCA board, I'm also on the GROW board as well. Uh, my grandpa always told me you have to keep busy to stay out of trouble, right? So if you're interested in finding out more about GROW, you can go to GROW, G-R-O-I-W-M dot org, to find out more about their research. Uh, next up, our speaker is Dr. Jason Bond. He is the professor of plant biology at the College of Agricultural Sciences and Physical Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Dr. Bond's research and teaching program focuses on disease management and row crops in the Midwest. Dr. Bond is the second generation plant pathologist and he was raised on a watermelon farm in southeastern Louisiana. He received his PhD in plant health from the Louisiana State University in 1999. Today, Dr. Bond will be giving a presentation about soybean stem diseases that was funded by the Illinois Soybean Association and I'm very excited to hear some results uh, so let's please welcome Dr. Bond.
Thank you. I'm going to try to do this with water up here without messing up this uh, computer. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> I, at the CCA conference, I almost died up there. I brought my bottle of water, but I was not prepared. I didn't do the cap beforehand, and also I almost <laughs> I perished up on the stage. I got uh, dry mouth. I, I have to kind of build up to speaking, and so we've not yet gotten into the semester. Our semester started on Tuesday, but the, with the weather, they closed it, so... My voice may not make it through, uh, through the uh, through the length of the presentation, so we'll we'll see how it goes. The um, I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, this is a, a wonderful facility. It's amazing. Um, Ren Lake is uh, real special to to me and my wife, and um, uh, we've got a great ag program here, great ag instructors, uh, great students. Um, we like you to send more of them to SIU. I mean, it's just uh, a wonderful um, uh, institution here. And also with Illinois Soybean Association, we're very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak today and also talk about some of the research uh, that has been funded by ISA. Now, uh, you don't normally see a lot of presentations where someone would uh, maybe lump this many organisms in one one talk. So I will not be able to go through line by line on every one of these organisms that are in the state of Illinois that do's call, do's call, that does cause problems uh, to stem uh, health and also cause some, uh, some significant stem diseases. Um, they are kind of a grab bag. Uh, they, uh, they, people just kind of lump them into just a stem disease group. Um, and a lot of it's due to really our attention with, in terms of plant pathology as it relates to soybean health has been uh, greatly focused on what's going on in the soil. We have a lot of major root pathogens that cause us immediate problems right off the bat with seedling diseases and debilitating damage throughout the entirety of the year. Uh, some of these organisms do move up into the stem. Um, and then we have another uh, big focus on foliar diseases. Uh, we see them, they're very easy to, to uh, recognize. They're really not that hard to identify and, and separate from the other foliar diseases because they're very unique in the symptoms they cause. And we can also see that when we spray foliar fungicides, we see a response. So those are very um, at the forefront of, of what we see. Um, but with the stem diseases, they, they're kind of a, a, they all do something a little bit different from one another. And then one of the most uh, insidious things that they do is they usually attack the plant uh, throughout the, uh, the reproductive stages or when the plant is green. Later on, we don't, they don't show that they're there until later on. So they have this uh, long incubation period in many cases. So they're there affecting your crop and you don't know that they're there until you either at harvest or sometimes you can go out and actually see the visible signs of the pathogen at the very end of the year. So they're, they're kind of a, a difficult group to, to have broad generalizations. So I'm gonna attempt to do that today. So uh, we have a, a pretty healthy plant pathology program we, at SIU, just to kind of give you an update. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, myself or, or my colleague, uh, Ahmad Fakori, uh, we have what you would consider to be both a basic research um, in plant pathology and also applied research. So we're very interested in how these pathogens are interacting with plants at the gene for gene level and then also we're also very interested in how do we control them long term in our fields with a, a very sustainable approach. Generally pathogens just like weeds adapt to us trying to manage them. That's why plant pathologists and plant readers and, and, and weed scientists have job security because these things adapt and, and are always evolving and becoming more and more difficult to manage. So it requires a, a complexity or in terms of the management strategies that we would uh, use to control them. Uh, we have a, a wonderful family uh, in plant pathology at SIU. We really um, have a, a large uh, a group of grad students and also undergrad students. And uh, you know we put on Tyvek suits uh, starting like in May, and it goes all the way through August, where we're standing out in the fields trying to uh, manage um, all the other constraints so we can really focus the research and our attention on the, the, what the plant pathogens are impacting um, 
uh, in terms of our, uh, our yields. And so you always worry. I mean, we, that's, uh, I have a whole, uh, even when I'm there with them and we're watching them, uh, when you have Tyvek suits on, you're pretty uh, concerned about uh, people dying very quickly or having a lot of issues with regards to heat. And so it's always reassuring to see these younger uh, um, uh, people on the staff out taking uh, selfie photos uh, uh, when they're wearing their Tyvek suits. So uh, you, when you see that going on, you know you're probably in pretty good shape, at least uh, for the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So um, this is uh, the, our plant pathology uh, family. Uh, as of today, our, we have a senior technician, uh, Annie Paget. We have a, one postdoctoral student, uh, Dr. Zian Liu. We have seven PhD students right now. and. Um, uh, that are, or many of them are involved in this project. And we also have a lot of undergrad researchers. Um, uh, we don't ever want to take that for granted. We have nine of them now. Uh, we've kind of rebuilt our, and this is true for a lot of our research programs, been able to rebuild this undergraduate base of students. Uh, COVID did a, just a number on the availability uh, of students. Uh, so we're, uh, we seem like we've coming out of that uh, pretty strong. So um, this is kind of a, uh, sales message uh, for not only for Jessica at University of Illinois and Carla at SIU and myself, but we need more undergrads. And so we are always looking to hire. If any of you know people, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, reach out to us and uh, see if we can um, uh, get you placed in, in one of our programs. So this is uh, kind of our focus with a lot of our uh, plant pathology research. As I said, we do quite a bit of um, um, effort with regards to foliar diseases. Um, and then also with below ground, we spend a, quite a bit of time and resources looking at a lot of our soil-borne uh, pathogens that are impacting plant health. And uh, a couple years ago, um, myself, Ahmad, uh, Kelly Estes at the University of Illinois, and Nick Sider at the University of Illinois uh, put in a, a joint project uh, to Illinois Soybean Association to look at diseases and in insects that are impacting um, STEM health in the state of Illinois. So today I'll focus primarily on uh, the, um, uh, the, the STEM diseases, not, not the insects. I'd probably get in trouble pretty quickly uh, getting, getting into that world. Um, as we get started, um, I wanted to point out two excellent sources of, uh, of information um, on this subject. Um, now I do need to caution you, I'm not like Kelsey and some of the others that are probably a lot more well, not probably, but are a whole lot more versed in creating these QR codes. Um, I, to, I've only done this twice. Um, I tested that. It did work, but, you know, um, I don't know if there's any kind of best management practices on which QR code generators you use. This, I don't know if that's going to some server in China or whatever, but that's, uh, that's my cautionary note that I'm sorry if, if you use that and something bad happened on your computer. But... Um, so this website is the uh, Soybean uh, Research Information Network. It's funded by the checkoff uh, from each of the states. And it is a really nice website. Uh, they did a really good job with the layout of it. Uh, for instance, we, if we go to soybean diseases, uh, this would be, you know, kind of the, the, gives you a little bit of background information. If I click on like anthracnose um, stem blight, so that's one of the organisms that, or diseases that we're really interested in. If you click on that where it says view disease, it brings up these nice photos. Uh, and there's also a little bit more information. And then if I clicked on this photo on the left, this is probably something many of us have seen in our fields. Every field we survey, we will find this organism uh, on the stems um, of our plants. And so if you were to click on that image, it brings up a closer uh, picture of what anthracnose looks like. And, you know, I believe in being humble. Um, every year, even I, even I've seen these organisms all the time, I still have to refer to, okay, my anthracnose is my blotchy one. My pod and stem blight, very similar and nice tight little rows of the little sporulation. So those are some real helps that they have on this website to, to kind of train your eyes uh, to be able to identify what's, what's going on in your field. So it's a, a wonderful website uh, for that. Um, also, there's the uh, Crop Protection Network. Uh, this is also a really good website. Again, same cautionary note on the QR code on the far right. This one is uh, really managed by the uh, land-grant universities. Uh, excellent site. It's a little bit more technical. You can just imagine uh, when you have the um, scientist involved in putting it together. Great information. Probably not as user friendly as the previous previous one I showed you. But you can also see on the left hand side. You can kind of there's a whole lot more than just soybean diseases. 
uh, or soybeans um, uh, that you can um, uh, to select, but that's the way you would select down uh, to then get to the diseases, and then you can see some of the uh, some of the articles that would be in this. So there, some of them are very recent, and some of them are like it's a database that goes back, to, you know, uh, into the uh, 2010. Um, so very good information, um, um, but maybe not not quite as um, user friendly, but um, an excellent source. So we have a effects of weed on soybean here. So we even have that represented. So that was a SIU publication uh, that was uh, funded by the Illinois Soybean Association. I don't want to get off on that, but that was an excellent project where we showed that double cropping with wheat reduced our soybean cyst nematode populations by 32 percent. So um, excellent um, um, management tool to add to our uh, system for trying to control uh, soybean cyst nematode. So when we look at the economic impact of the important uh, soybean diseases, uh, this is um, just the top uh, diseases. There's over 30 diseases that we work with in the United States that can impact soybean yield. But these would be the most common ones. Um, on the far left-hand side, yeah, that doesn't work. I'm glad I've figured that out now that it doesn't. <laughs> I've been trying it for quite a while. So on the far left-hand side, that's soybean systematode. And I probably should remove it from the chart because it draws the attention away really from the other pathogens. But it's just over the top in terms of yield loss. That's 120, over 120 million bushels annually that's lost to just that one pathogen. Um, but as you go into these others, it's still massive losses. So in the seedling disease group, there's at least 10 major seedling diseases that are represented here. So it's not just one disease. Uh, there's many different organisms that are affecting our, the, the stand uh, and emergence of our soybean seeds and maybe even the early establishment of our, our soybean crop. The next one is uh, Phytophthora root rot. Going on down the list, we have sudden death syndrome, sclerotinia stem rot. We don't typically see that disease heavily in southern Illinois. Um, typically it's going to be more of a northern Illinois disease. The pathogen is here. It just so happens to when that pathogen is producing its spores to infect our flowers, it needs cool or cooler and misty kind of conditions. We don't typically have that when our soybeans are flowering. So we, we get avoidance of the disease just because of that disease cycle isn't lined up in, in our environment. But the pathogen is here. If you, you know, if you grow vegetable beans, vegetable crops, you will come across uh, sclerotinia stem rot um, in this area. It's just not going to be probably on your soybeans. Uh, then we have charcoal rot, that's CR, uh, stem canker, brown stem rot, anthracnose, pod and stem blight, and frog eye leaf spot. So those are some of the, the most important ones that we deal with. We would find all of these really in the state of Illinois. Um, those that are what we consider to be pathogens that kind of tend to focus on uh, the stem and maybe the, the pods uh, would be Phytophthora root rot, sclerotinia, charcoal rot, stem canker, anthracnose, and pod and stem blight. So most of these uh, stem diseases, they're caused by pathogens that, I don't want to say native, but they're local, they're here they're, and they, they don't go away. And so they are overwintering, in some cases, in the soil, um, in many cases in our residue. Um, and then they also can be brought into your area. So you can do a fantastic job of disease management on your operation. And it's one of those things that as it relates to pathogens and many other constraints in agriculture, what your neighbor is doing or not doing can greatly influence your operation. So these these organisms that cause stem disease can move into your, uh, your fields uh, from surrounding areas. Um, the, um, there, there are several of these stem pathogens that are seed transmitted. So we can bring them to your field on seed that are infected. So the seed companies spend obviously quite a bit of time looking at seed quality and increasing uh, these, their, their varieties in locations would, that would tend to have less um, uh, uh, pressure from these seed pathogens, perhaps spraying foliar fungicides, irrigating them in a, in a way that's not going to uh, cause a greater um, seed infection. Um, but this is where one of the aspects of where you would use seed treatments to impact the, the, the pathogen that's in the seed or on the seed 
whereas most of our seed treatments really are focused for what's in the soil and what's gonna be attacking our plants. But in, in this case, you would get some benefit if your seed is infected with these stem pathogens, if there's a seed treatment. At least you may not protect that plant from having the symptoms, but you might slow down the, the, maybe the rate of explosion from those few plants that are infected uh, so it's not infecting the entirety of the field. Uh, so all of our production practices will have a great influence on the incidence and severity of stem diseases. Um, many of the things that we need to do as it relates to uh, ro rotation, um, reducing our tillage, um, uh, those, anything that's gonna leave more residue, crop residue or soybean residue on the surface is gonna allow that organism to um, overwinter better. So if we have more residue, we had a bad year with stem diseases, we have a lot of residue in that field, that field probably is not at risk because you're rotating the corn that year. So that's one of the nice things about most of our soybean pathogens. They are focused on soybeans and other legumes or other uh, broadleaf crops. So when we switch to wheat or, or corn in those fields, they don't hop between those two hosts. So we get the rotation benefit. But we, in any field, you do still see the soybean residue from, from previous years and also the surrounding area. So you have a lot of inoculum potential always uh, in your area. Um, the other um, aspect of this is when we think about that disease cycle is the pathogen, as I said, is m in most cases, the pathogen is present. It's always the constant in our disease triangle. So we have to have those three components to get disease. That's the most simplest explanation of what causes disease is we need a susceptible host. We need a conducive environment for both the host and also the pathogen and then we need the pathogen present. So we always have the pathogen present. We're, we're kind of changing the game on the pathogen when we do our crop rotation, which is a good thing, but the, the other aspect of that is the environment. So when you aren't seeing the pathogen in your field causing stem diseases, it's because one of these two things have changed. Either you're growing corn or wheat in that field, or the environment was not conducive for that pathogen to cause the symptoms, the severity of the symptoms um, in that particular year. But that's a, that's a limited time um, effect. So as soon as the environment is conducive, you would see it. Maybe it would not be that year, but maybe maybe the next. So we we have to remember that as we relate with um, as we deal with managing these these organisms, they're they're always present. They may not always be causing disease. Now, I'll try not to just inter interchangeably use the term disease and pathogen. Those are two separate things. The disease is the symptoms. The causal agents is, is what we're trying to truly manage, which, is, which are, which are the, the fungal pathogens. So it really, a lot of our management of our, seed, uh, our stem diseases starts with our seed selection. So I, what I did was um, under, um, I'm not trying to advocate one seed company over another, so I've chosen three to just show how they list this information and how we use this information to interpret which varieties to plant in some of these uh, locations. And so some of it's a little bit, um, there's not consistency amongst the different pathogens um, on how that information is reported um, within a company and then even across companies. And a lot of it's due to the, um, how the, the, the genetics to manage the pathogen in these plants, how, that, how much is known about that, and then how, how much is even, um, is even shared. But if you look on the far left, that's Phytophthora root rot. Um, in any seed um, listing, you will generally see two types of information for Phytophthora root rot. Normally, we ignore this in Illinois. Last year, we got torched by Phytophthora root rot across a good portion of Illinois, over to Missouri, and, and even further north. Uh, we used to kind of look at that one as you'd see what was going on in Ohio, which is always a Phytophthora dead zone over there. They have a major issue with that the whole time I've been at SIU since the 2000s and even before that. Um, and we, we see it, it's usually pretty localized, but it was much more widespread this year and there's several things that are going on with regards to our genetics, both in the plant, but also in the pathogen. But generally, when you look at the Phytophthora root rot information, 
the field tolerance, what that is indicating is they're trying to convey the, um, um, the, how the pathogen responds to multiple isolates of the organism. So you would want a field tolerance score to be, that, that would be probably your primary focus. Um, if you look on the, where it shows the gene for resistance, what they're showing there is the resistance that they have as it matches up to a particular race of that pathogen. Now, if you listed the, all the races of Phytophthora soji on the thing, it would be, it would go all the way to the floor. I mean, it's very, it's, it's not a fun area to work in in terms of pathogen diversity. Um, but as it relates to this, what they're showing is that that gene and how it would match up to against certain races of Phytophthora. This really, that gene resistance really comes into play as you are trying to diagnose what the heck happened in this field. Why did this variety do this versus the other variety that's nearby that's not showing this? So for some forensic work, that, that becomes very important. And also in future years, knowing that that isolate that I have in that field defeats RPS1C or, or 1K. So that's why they have that, um, that, that dual listing there uh, for that. So um, what happened this year, what we experienced, is usually pathogens are, are adapting over a long period of time. Or once they go into a new area, it takes a while for them to become uh, um, enough presence in the soil or in the plants for us to identify that they're there and they're causing a problem. And so what happens is we're deploying resistance to, to manage these pathogens, we're forcing them, to, we're telling them, you either uh, eat this or you die. And so they usually eat this at some level within their population, and then they have more and more individuals as they reproduce that are capable of, enter, uh, of defeating that resistance. And so we have relied on certain types of resistance for quite a while, and those organisms have been adapting. And last year, that disease triangle came into full focus. We had, the, we had the host, we had a much more virulent pathogen, and we had an environment that really drove a lot of Phytophthora root knot um, uh, incidents across the, the Midwest. So that's the starting point for Phytophthora, looking at that field tolerance, but also keeping in mind what type of um, a specific gene or um, resistance uh, that is available. Um, I did fail to point out one thing too. Anytime you're looking, and everybody probably has, has experienced this to some degree or another, when you're looking at the various uh, sources of information like this, when we see rating severity, as a plant pathologist, my first thing is what is the rating scale? So it's very important. So this happens to be off of a Syngenesis website. One is great in, in their book and with a lot of companies. Other companies like to say 10 is great. So you kind of need to know what your extremes are. Doesn't really matter in that four, five, and six range. Um, that's usually bad for everybody, you know? Nobody likes to say their thing is terrible. So you don't normally see a lot of those. But when I, I start seeing that five, four, five, and six, that's my alarm bell um, for any of those rating systems. But that's important to, to know what is my best and what is my worst, so I know what I'm, what I'm comparing apples to apples if I'm flipping back and forth between various charts. So as we move on down, you see they have a listing um, for southern stem canker. Um, the last uh, maybe five or six years, this one was a major yield robber in Illinois. Um, and it's probably been doing that for many, many years. It causes symptoms that are almost indistinguishable from sudden death syndrome. There are a few things that you can do to separate them out, but a lot of fields will have both of them. So basically you have SDS symptoms with these little black blotches up and down the stem. It, the, a better name for the disease would be soybean stem cankers, not canker, because when you think canker, you're looking for a single lesion that's a canker on the, on the stem. That, that's not true for this disease. That's more true for, for, for Phytophthora. So, um, so that's one of the uh, things to, uh, to keep in mind, that it's, it's ever-present in, in our fields. And so they have a, a listing for that. Skipping um, root knot nematode, which is impressive that they would have that listed. Uh, that's an important pest here in southern Illinois that's become more and more uh, problematic. Uh, then you see brown stem rot, charcoal rot, soybean white mold, and pod and stem blight. 
uh, those are important uh, STEM pathogens. And so as you look on these data sets, you'll see this across several of the companies. When you see those little lines, that means that they're, it's not that they have bad info that they don't want to reveal to you, because that would be much better than saying the lines. I just put this little hash mark there. No, that, line, that typically indicates they don't have data on how that line would perform against that, uh, that pathogen. And so you'd say, well, why don't the company spend more money on that? Well, they do spend a lot of money on that, but many of you know in this room that these varieties are on the market for four or five years. And then they're constantly, there's so much breeding and advancements with the breeders and plant pathologists and product placement that these varieties are constantly being shuffled off. So by the time you built this perfect variety or this perfect description of this variety across all pathogens, it would already be off the market. So that's, um, they have a limited time frame as the breeders are getting ready to release some, this, this material. If they happen to hit a window where they just did not get a lot of disease pressure in their disease nurseries because of the disease triangle wasn't matching up in those fields, they don't have the information to be able to pass on with those varieties. So it's important as they're developing those varieties to, to have those environments so they don't have escapes, so they can get good information on how those varieties will perform. So this is a, another um, a company's list, and this is uh, for ASGRO. You can see a little bit different to, uh, in how they organize it, but it's same information or similar information. So Phytophthora root rot resistance, Phytophthora root rot field tolerance, a uh, little bit um, a similarity there. White mold, brown stem rot, uh, sudden death syndrome, uh, frog LE spot, those are really not stem pathogens. Um, and then also uh, southern uh, stem canker, you can see the listing uh, for that variety. And also you can see that even with their lines, there's, there's a lot of uh, unknowns there in terms of the reaction um, that they kind of update over time if they get that information depending on uh, where the varieties are being placed. And then here, this last one, this one's up with Pioneer. You can see um, a little different designation with regards to so Phytophthora re, uh, resistance gene, Phytophthora field tolerance. Um, so they just have abbreviated, so that 1K is just the last part of that, um, uh, the gene name. Then also they have the field tolerance. Um, then in their, in their case, they're showing they have a brown stem rot marker. So usually when companies will designate the gene or the marker, that that's indicating that the plant has that, but they're not, um, you know, it's not yet been maybe in, in all cases been fully hit in a real nasty brown stem rot field environment. So sometimes what the markers tell us about the lines needs, we find something else once they're in a field in a, under intense uh, disease pressure. So you'll see that designation. Even for stem canker, you'll see it says stem canker gene. Most cases, it works just as good as a, a field evaluation, but typically they, the companies will use both. And then over time, they may start um, adding that, that information as well once they get more of the, the um, information from the fields. So one thing to point out, too, is um, even when we deploy things like Phytophthora root rot resistance, um, those resistance genes take a while for the plant to be able to benefit from, from them being there. So a, 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 a seed that's emerging, a seed um, of the, uh, roots that are trying to get established and you're trying to get the plant emerged, that resistance is usually not being expressed at that time period. That's expressed a little bit later on in the plant's life. So that's why you would still want to use things like seed treatments to protect the resistance. So the, seed the fungicide seed treatment allows the plant to get established, gives that two to three week uh, window of protection. Then those resistance genes will, will carry the plant out through the remainder of its life. So some, uh, um, um, some, some pathogens still require uh, both the combination of the seed treatment, but also the, the host resistance uh, to manage. So I want to talk a little bit about um, our funded uh, research project and, and what we're finding. Um, so one of the, kind of the, the reason for the project is, even though we have this nice bar graph to do these estimates of losses, um, we still, the frequency and the uh, severity of many of these seedling disease, uh, these uh, stem diseases across the state and across most of our states is, is lacking. 
And so we wanted to get more information on that. Um, and then we also um, wanted to uh, get a better handle on what's there uh, with different tools that we have as opposed to just waiting till the end of the year to go out and look at stems and seeing, okay, they had a stem disease problem here. So there's some tools that we can use uh, even prior to uh, the, the, uh, the evidence of the, of, the, of the disease. And so we wanted to be able to, uh, to do that as well. So the objectives were, were twofold. Number one, we wanted to develop a survey tool for growers to learn about what they were experiencing. So we uh, ran this through the Illinois Soybean Association. They, they helped really, dis uh, we, we came up with the questions, but they made it in a way that you could actually ask somebody something that you would get some good information back. So it was a very uh, important to have them help us develop the survey. And we got a lot of great information from producers about what were their experiences on their farm? What, what, are, they, what are they seeing? How do they manage uh, stem diseases and, and things of that nature? Also, as a part of that survey, they had the opportunity to send samples uh, to SIU, and then we would be able to identify which organisms are, are in the stem samples they sent. Now, I do need to clarify, there may be several people in here that sent samples. We are not the disease clinic at the state of Illinois. The disease clinic, in addition to having great skills and techniques and things of that nature, they have a customer service component of that disease clinic, and you also are paying for that, um, that sample to get processed. So they have a need to quickly get this information out. A lot of the samples, as they are brought in, uh, they come to us, we, sometimes we can make a call right away just looking at the disease tissue, and we can match that to the symptom. Many of you do that in the field. You go out and see symptoms, and it's just like, bam, that's, that's that disease. When you're dealing with symptom, multiple signs or symptoms on a plant, or in some cases, no symptoms, we kind of do some exploratory stuff of what's going on in there. And so that can take a little while to get these organisms to not want to grow in the stem of the soybean plant anymore, but now to grow on some little artificial plates or media that we have in, in the laboratory to culture those organisms. So we're, it takes, takes quite a while. So if you are looking for some information that you've sent to us um, and just see me after the meeting and we'll try to uh, see what, what the timeline would be on that. So I always need to uh, talk about how great that disease clinic is at the state of Illinois, but also that, that we are not the disease clinic. So we have uh, two different uh, uh, focuses. So the, uh, some of the collection of samples uh, that uh, came in, um, as, so we got the survey information, and then we moved to a second part of a survey, and this is actually a surveying of fields. So we visited a lot of fields. Uh, we had uh, members of the Illinois Soybean Association visiting fields and, and contacting farmers, and then also as part of that, um, that survey tool, people would send us a sample. So we had a good representation across the state of Illinois, almost every county, and um, in central and uh, southern Illinois. Um, and so in this case, plants were collected at maturity. So we are kind of biasing it at that time of year. Um, and then the, we would then assess the samples for stem diseases. And so that's based off of what type of symptomology, or in some cases, the actual fruiting bodies of the pathogen, which is it's a wonderful thing for them to do that for you because that really aids in the, not only our ability to identify what's causing that symptom, we can also get cultures off of those little things we see with our eyes a whole lot easier than just going into the tissue uh, um, and trying to isolate the organisms. And so these are the organisms that were isolated. Um, we have uh, just some examples here. We had over 25 species that have been identified to date. Um, uh, many more than we, we thought we would see, and a few oddballs in there as well. Now, one thing I do need to point out, we have some pictures, just some examples here. No way is it this easy where this fusarium at B, everybody in the room can tell it apart from fusarium in Car carnatum versus fusarium uh, fujicori. So sometimes these organisms have wonderful differences in terms of how they grow. Some stay kind of small, like you see with Cladosporium. Some not only fill the whole plate, they just push the top off the plate so they grow real fast. Um, some grow, um, have this pigmentation, so there's many reasons why they do that. Sometimes that helps them in this chemical warfare that's going on between all these organisms and also some of these chemicals they use to attack the plant. Um, 
Sometimes they produce these pigments, so their spores are more uh, UV resistant. So that's the way these organisms can move great distances, hundreds of miles in many cases, and still the spores be viable when they land at the infection court. So this is not representation of everything that comes out. So for every one of those that looks like that says B with Fusarium incarnatum, we might have 20 other species that are 20 other isolates or plates that look identical to that and are not that organism. So we always have to end up going to the micro microscopic level, looking at what type of spores they might be producing. And sometimes they don't want to do that. So we have to then go into the molecular tools to be able to confirm uh, what's there. So it can take quite a, uh, quite a, a bit of time to go through just one sample and characterize uh, what's there. It's, in some cases, you get a disease sample that comes in. Um, I'm kind of looking at this table over here, not for any particular reason, but when you go to, there's a big bar fight somewhere, and they have to go in and they have to separate out the, the people. You know, you got the people who started it, you got the people that were somewhat involved, you got the innocent people that are just don't know what's happening, and then you got some people that are just, we don't know what their role in it was, you know, and they never figured it out. And so you have this in almost every sample. You'll have the pathogens, you'll have some parasites that are there, but they're not causing disease, so they're not called pathogens. Um, in some cases, these parasites turn out to be great things because they're taking a niche away from a pathogen that wants to to cause harm. So in a good, case, a good example is uh, we're, we're slightly uh, surprised that ep ep Epicoccum and also Cladosporium are there. there are, those are known fungal antagonists. So those, fun those are fungi that feed on other fungi. Now that's kind of a, a when we think about trying to manage plant diseases to, to have something happen like that, it's like, wow, this is like wonderful. This is like exceptional. Does it happen all the time? Yes, usually out in nature, but you know, in terms of our production system, we kind of move to systems where we just have one or two crops, a lot of it, uh, uh, increased efficiency with those crops. Those, those things kind of, in some cases, kind of reduce some of these beneficials that are in the soil that are also going to infect the plants, but in, in their case of infecting plants, they don't bring about harm, and in some cases they bring about good because they're taking this niche away from these pathogens that, uh, that, that do want to cause harm to the plant. So a lot of uh, great information that's coming out of that. We, we um, increased our, um, since most of these organisms attack the stem, many of them also will attack the seeds. And so uh, ISA helped us over the last two years to secure some seed sources um, uh, through the Illinois uh, Variety Testing Program. Last year they sent us samples that, uh, you know, um, my colleague, uh, he's got great ideas and sometimes just the logistics. We got a room about this size full of seed from the, uh, that we had to go through and process from Illinois Variety Testing. So it was uh, just an overwhelming blessing that you almost didn't know how to manage, you know. So uh, it was like quite the um, assembly line just to get their, their seeds down into some little vials that could then be long-term stored. And then we could start the process of identifying seed quality, um, uh, doing some of the conventional methods where we try to see what will grow from those seeds, but then also the molecular techniques to actually get in there and see what DNA of the organisms are in those seed samples. So we're, uh, that's a second component of the stem health is not only what's going on in the stems, but what's going on in, the, in, in our seed samples. And so many of the uh, company reps um, here in this region also sent us a lot of seed samples uh, this year as well. So um, towards, um, when I say this year, uh, 2023, and so we're, we're kind of working our way through those, those samples. So, as it, so this is organisms, the causal agents in some cases, these are our pathogens. This is the incidence of the diseases in which they cause. So this is something that most of us in this room probably are pretty good at going out into the field and looking at our stems, the, looking at foliage throughout the season, and seeing the actual symptoms of those diseases. We do not need microscopes in most cases for this. We are actually looking at the symptoms of a, a, of a sick patient. Just like when we're sick with the flu, we're not seeing the virus, we're seeing the symptoms, the headaches, the, the muscle fatigue, and I hope I'm not speaking this into existence for any of us, but the, those are the symptoms of that disease. And so this is the same scenario as it relates to our soybeans. So we're going out and we're seeing the symptoms um, uh, of, what, was, um, of what, uh, what, what we received and, and what was sent in. So 
And every sample that has been processed to date uh, from, from the stems that came in from Illinois, we either um, had, anthrac we had anthracnose and the diaporthy complex in every single sample. So that's probably the two culprits, those two along with um, uh, those two primarily. When we spray fungicides, many of you have seen this, you have maybe a non-treated check at some place, uh, a part of the field, or maybe that half the field did not get sprayed, and you see that nice brown color of the area that got sprayed and the other area that did not get sprayed, that, that general grayish look, that's these two organisms, di diaporthy, or those two diseases, diaporthy and anthracnose. Yes? The last two years? Then? Yes, the last two years. Yes, yeah. Um, so on uh, the seed samples that were, have been collected either through that process or through the last um, year and a half through the Illinois Soybean Association, um, that's the incidence of Phomopsis on the seed. So that would be not a big issue if your seed are going to the elevator, but if you're replanting that seed or if that seed is, was not harvested and, and got left in the field, if it had that Phomopsis on it, that is a, a nice uh, 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 source of inoculum uh, for the next year. So quite a bit of Phomopsis. Uh, SDS was found in over 40% of the uh, samples uh, that came in. And charcoal rot um, was really prevalent uh, last year for sure, and then in, in the previous year as well. So charcoal rot, um, many people don't talk about it. You did see in some of the, uh, uh, for the three companies, many of them do now list um, some kind of information with regards to uh, charcoal rot. There is no, most of the resistance is available to it is, is, is partial resistance. And um, there's not a whole lot of that in our germplasm. It's a very difficult pathogen to work with. All, everyone struggles with easy to grow, easy to culture, easy to inoculate, but a variety that looks fantastic for charcoal rot resistance this year, uh, next year um, will we'll show a lot of symptoms and a lot of losses. So it's a, uh, fungicides don't work against it. Um, it's just, it's, and it's across 500 plant species, so it affects your corn crop, it affects sorghum really bad. Um, so there's, it's got a lot of uh, host, um, and also in any of those, we really don't have a whole lot of management options for charcoal rot other than irrigating more. So, I mean, how many people um, have that option? And really all you're doing is you're not eliminating the pathogen, you're just eliminating or reducing some of the drought stress that the pathogen is kind of ramping up inside the, uh, inside the stem. Um, so Fusarium root rot, Rhizectonia, brown stem rot, southern blight, uh, we, we didn't pick up um, those in our samples, even though they, I'm not saying they're not here in the state of Illinois. Uh, we can find them uh, generally in, in most years, but um, in this survey so far, we've not uh, picked them up. And we did, over the last two years, start picking up uh, some red crown rot. Um, in the, not only this, this survey, but also, obviously, it's a, a disease that's, um, uh, that's uh, on, on the move here in Illinois and, and seems to be uh, getting uh, worse. So I'll talk a little bit more about red crown rot in just, uh, just a second. So, uh, so far, we have um, uh, 26 uh, species. Um, multiple isolates of many of those species. I won't go into why that's important, but that's important for any database or any type of collection uh, to have multiple isolates of those species as we are watching how they're evolving and adapting to our control practices. Um, stem canker and charcoal rot were, um, um, were very prevalent over the last uh, two years. And then also in 2023, red crown rot was seen at um, several locations, not only as part of this survey, but also um, uh, through uh, many of the uh, uh, scouting efforts by Illinois Soybean Association and also uh, with uh, crop consultants um, and, and industry uh, this uh, past uh, couple years. So for uh, red crown rot, um, this is uh, first reported in Illinois in 2019. Um, more than likely it was here long before that, uh, but that was when it was first confirmed. Um, the reason why we it was prob we think it was probably here for a long period of time is the symptoms that it causes. A picture from uh, Nathan Klecheskly uh, took. Uh, you can see the intervenal um, uh, uh, chlorosis and necrosis that looks very similar to sudden death syndrome. And in many of these fields where you would see red crown rot, you would also see SDS. Um, and then in addition to that, you could possibly have some Phytophthora. 
Root rot will cause a similar symptom. Stem canker will cause a similar symptom to this, at least in terms of the, the chlorosis and necrosis that you see on the leaves. So it's very possible it was here um, for prior to 2019. And the, um, it was first reported in the United States um, in the 1960s on peanut and then in the 1970s on soybean. When I was in grad school at LSU in the late 90s, uh, the professor that was working on <clears throat> uh, red crown rod at the time, there, here's the water break. <clears throat> uh, computer survived that. So <clears throat> the, uh, in the night, uh, so my, the professor I was working on at the time, uh, he would uh, tell students that they found it in this county or that, we call them parishes in Louisiana, but uh, he, he would have certain areas that he knew that he would never see it. And he would give them like a bounty if they went and found it. And when he came to Illinois, he gave a, even a much bigger bounty. I remember him telling all the grad students, uh, I was uh, just starting here at SIU at the time, he would tell them he'd give them $10,000 if they could go find red crown rot. So you can just imagine grad students like, I'm, that's it, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna get rich, I'm gonna go find red crown rot. And they, <clears throat> they never did. Uh, but he always told me that he would never find it on any county or parish that was not touching the Gulf of Mexico. So he thought it was something tied very closely to those, it wants those warmer soil temperatures, but he thought that was the niche that it needed to be a very prevalent disease, one that would show up every year. And so <clears throat> I don't know what's happened, how that organism has adapted, our environment has changed, uh, but we're definitely now seeing it much uh, more widespread uh, distribution. Uh, the fungal pathogen, once it's in your field, um, just like most of the organisms we deal with, it produces some microsclerotia. So those are, the sclerotia is just, if you think about the, you think about bread mold, or you see how that organism is growing on your bread, that's the mycelia, or the hyphae of the organism. You're, you're looking at the body of the fungus. And so those, many fungi have the capacity to take that, their body and make it into dense material that is over that makes it um, very good at overwintering, and so then they can be in that state, in in many cases for years, through many types of rotation, through in those parts of the disease cycle that are not conducive for the pathogen, it doesn't um, uh, emerge from that little microscrotia, it doesn't germinate and infect under under harsh conditions. So. Once you have it, it's, you're probably going to be, it's kind of like high blood pressure. Okay, what are my steps to live with this and manage it? I'm not going to be able to eliminate it, more than likely. <clears throat> so the, uh, the symptoms, as I said, um, uh, mimic a lot of the other diseases that we have um, and can lead to um, severe defoliation. So you can have some significant yield loss associated with it if those foliar symptoms and the defoliation are occurring uh, in those early to uh, mid-reproductive uh, stages. So the, um, on the stem, you can see the signs of the pathogen, and that's also where the common name of the disease comes from, th for red crown rot. You can see on the crown of the plants that reddish uh, discoloration. Now this is awesome when you see it in the field and you can use, okay, I can see that, I can identify the, the disease. The, the problem is, is not every plant that's infected by this pathogen and is suffering from the symptoms of red crown rot will give you those nice symptoms. It's somewhat similar to what we see with sudden death syndrome. Probably many of you have picked up a soybean plant that was str uh, struggling with sudden death syndrome and you see the blue sporulation of the pathogen. If I dig a 100 plants that are in a bad SDS location, 10 plant or 100 plants that are showing symptoms, I might only see that blue sporulation on maybe 10% of the plants. So they don't have to have this red, these red signs on this stalk of the, of the plant for it to be red crown rot. So we probably are missing quite a bit of it because we're digging up roots and we're looking for what the disease is called. We're looking for the red crown, and you may not see that. So the, the parathesia, that's a little fruiting body of the organism that it produces to produce more spores. Um, it doesn't always, it's not always doing that. And then also, as we're pulling plants up or maybe under other conditions, those little fruiting bodies will sometimes get knocked off. And so you, you, you won't see them then as well. So that's not the, if you see that, 
great. But that if you don't see it, that does not mean you can't say it's not red crown rot. <clears throat> so in many of those cases, <clears throat> if you are dealing with a situation where you have one of these newer or emerging pathogens, soil movement becomes very important on your field. You know, how you're moving that equipment around. And it's easy to say you need to sterilize your equipment um, or clean your equipment before going from field to field. I mean, I grew up on a farm. I, I did sound, those, a lot of things sound good until you're the one who's responsible to do that and you have a limited time to, to do that. Um, and then who, all, who else is driving around in your fields when you're not there? That, I know that happens because I see that on some of the production sites that... Um, uh, that we work at that you ask, well, who is that driving around? The farmer goes, I don't know who that is, you know? So you have a lot of, a lot of things going on in your field sometimes that are happening when, when you're not there. And so anything that's moving that soil can help this organism to not only infect new areas of a field, but also infect um, um, a new, um, a new fields as well. So some of our activities uh, for uh, 2024, we're uh, expanding our survey, wrapping up some of the uh, sample diagnostics that we have um, in our hands at this moment. We're also extending, extend, extending our uh, se uh, seed collection and then uh, uh, to be able to wrap up uh, this project, um, um, I think uh, this year. So uh, this concludes uh, my, I think I went a little bit short, so that's, um, that's not normal for me, but that's good. So. Uh, okay, you stumped the professor, <laughs> which is not hard to do. <laughs> Are there any questions? All right, thank you guys. So thank you so much, Dr. Bond. Uh, at this time, we're going to be taking a 15-minute break. Um, and I will tell you, or you'll probably figure out when we reconvene up here. Um, but go ahead, get up, move around, get some coffee, and network.
Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like everyone to rejoin me here in the meeting area, and we will continue our last presentation of the morning. Our last presenter today is Jessica Rakowski. She is a small grains breeder and a quantitative geneticist. Jessica currently leads the winter wheat breeding program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her mission is to develop wheat varieties that will help enhance farm profitability in Illinois as well as surrounding states. In line with this goal, Jessica's scholarly research program develops and implements new ways to make plant breeding and variety evaluation more effective with the help of technologies like remote sensing and gen genomics. Before joining the University of Illinois, Jessica completed her PhD in plant breeding at Cornell University and worked internationally for five years supporting plant breeding programs in less developed countries. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rakowski. Hello. Thanks everyone for watching this presentation, uh, staying till the end here. This is my first time at a Soybean Association sponsored event, so um, it's really exciting to get to know a new crowd of people. And uh, today I'm talking about wheat genetics and management considerations for double crop soybean success. First I'm gonna talk, introduce myself a little bit since I am new here. Um, I started at the University of Illinois as an assistant professor and a small grains breeder in 20, 2019. Um, and, but I've been working on small grains breeding since uh, 2009 when I started my uh, doctoral degree at Cornell, started working on wheat breeding. Uh, here in this picture is my research group. Uh, these are the, the graduate students and staff that work with me on small grains breeding. About two thirds of the people here are under my supervision working on wheat breeding specifically and the other third works on other small grains like oats and triticale and uh, other research uh, that focuses in that area. And my goal since I joined at the University of Illinois is to improve wheat for the wheat double crop soybean system. But I think this work has actually really been going on for a long time, even before I joined. My predecessor, the previous wheat breeder, Dr. Fred Kolb, had been doing this work, had been you know, breeding wheat and keeping the double crop soybean system in mind in that process. Uh, and then even before him, there was another breeder. So just to give you perspective, uh, we're standing in front of the, the, our uh, building where we, where we operate out of. That brick building in the background has been there since 1930s, so we've been around and doing this work for actually a really long time, even though probably a lot of people don't realize it or never really knew that the U of I was working on in this area. So I like to kind of get the word out that we are, a lot of us working on this and we've been doing it for a long time. And why am I here at a meeting talking about you know, soybeans and, and double cropping, and you know, what's the importance for us here in, in the state of Illinois? Well, it's actually really interesting that uh, we're actually in the top two states for wheat double crop soybean acres in the United States. It's between Illinois and North Carolina. And, and I think North Carolina has always, you know, been number one, but I think those numbers are kind of changing, and I would probably guess that last year we might have been number one based on you know, the number of acres and wheat acres being increased in the state. Um, Illinois is also the largest wheat producer in the eastern US, so east of the Mississippi, and also including, if you also include Missouri, we're number one in terms of wheat production in that entire region. And then if you look at the entire US, we're 10th overall. So no, people don't really realize how much wheat is being produced here and how important of a state we are for wheat production, but we, we really are pretty important in the grand scheme of things. Uh, acreage, uh, although you know, it pales in comparison to corn and soybeans, on, on average over the past five years, the acreage has been 620,000 wheat acres, and 80% of those are 
with double crop soybeans. So important for the state, uh, important for the country, and yet, you know, people don't often realize that. And I think there's a lot of benefits to keeping wheat in the rotation. We touched on this earlier today, talking about you know, the benefits of crop rotation generally for controlling you know, weeds and diseases. But including wheat in the rotation also provides benefits to the soil, so we can help reduce soil erosion. Um, going back to the other benefits like suppressing soybean cyst nematode populations, there's, you know, research has shown that, that wheat can help do that. Offering some weed control options, you know, just by uh, including wheat in the rotation. And then, but the last thing I wanna highlight and talk about more is the potential to enhance profitability. Because if we can't enhance profitability, all these other bullet points are not gonna be, we're not gonna see the benefits of those. You know, we have to be able to have, uh, you know, greater profit from growing wheat and, and including wheat in the rotation if we wanna see these other benefits and make sure that wheat double crop soybeans is economically viable. So if we look at over the past few years, this is data on profitability of wheat double crop soybeans on average in southern Illinois. So this graph shows the return for wheat double crop soybeans relative to just soybeans. So you can see that there's some years where wheat double crop soybeans is more profitable than just soybeans alone, and some years it's less profitable on average. Um, but if you look at it overall, so more, mo more often than not, the wheat double crop soybean return is greater than just soybean alone. But there's obviously a lot of room to grow here because you can see this bounces around depending on the year. So I would like to see this a little bit better. You know, we want to improve this aspect and make sure that we can get more consistent returns uh, and see a greater advantage from this system than what we currently do see. I also want to point out that these are averages. So there are a lot of people that are doing much better than this. And there are some people that may be achieving less success depending on you know, what the yields were in those fields. So a lot of room for improvement and a lot of variation in, in success and profitability from double crop soybeans. So I want to focus on profitability, and I'm, as a wheat breeder, I think a lot about wheat, obviously. I spent a lot of time looking at wheat and wheat genetics. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is from that point of view. But I think it's important to consider the whole system when making decisions. So it's not, you know, it's not just a matter of trying to maximize yield of wheat and trying to maximize yield of, of the double crop soybeans, but considering the whole system when uh, making decisions. And so I'm gonna be discussing what can be done on the wheat side to improve the system. But not to say that, you know, because I'm not talking about the double crop soybean side in this presentation, um, not to say that that's not important because obviously it is, you know, we have to think of the whole system, but I'll be talking, focusing in on the wheat side and, and giving some um, ideas based on some of my observations and what I know uh, about wheat and wheat genetics. Okay, so let's try to untangle profitability. What are the drivers or what are the levers that we can pull to manipulate this? And it's pretty easy to figure out um, what, that, what these levers are. So profit is just the wheat yield by the wheat price plus the double crop soybean yield times the soybean price and then all that minus the production cost. So that's a lot of, that looks simple when you can just write that formula there. Of course, it's you know, a lot more difficult to actually manipulate these in practice because we know that there's a lot that's not under our control. You know, the yields, not everything is always under our control. Prices are not always under our control, although there are things that we can control. And, um, and I hope I can give you some pointers, especially on the wheat side, on how do we improve the wheat yield? How do we improve the wheat price? How do we improve the double crop soybean yield? 
On the wheat side, there are basically three things that I think are most critical. There's a lot of other factors that can be considered, but the, probably the three biggest ones that are the most important would be harvesting early, and there are different ways to achieve that. We'll, we'll get into that. Controlling scab and improving yield. So although there's a, and still a lot to unpack there, right? Still a lot to discuss in each one of those. But if you can just think of those three things, when you're thinking about the wheat side of things, harvesting early, controlling scab, and improving yield. So then the question is how and why? You know, what's the importance of these and then how? All right, so earlier wheat harvest gives us higher soybean yields if we can plant the double crop soybeans earlier, right? So if we have, if we can plant um, two days earlier, we can get one bushel per acre more um, greater yield on the double crop soybeans. So if you put that into perspective in terms of dollars, if you think about the price per bushel of soybeans, two days delayed planting at, on, after harvesting wheat or at that, right around that time when you're planting double crop soybeans, every two days is worth $13 per acre. So just think about that. Think of that when you put that into perspective. Um, and so that's the value of being able to plant earlier. Every two days, you can gain a bushel, and that bushel's worth $13 per acre, or whatever the market price is at the time. Okay, talking about how to harvest earlier, three options, basically. Number one, you know, harvest wheat at, at a higher percent moisture and dry the grain. So that is great for many reasons. You know, you can help preserve the quality so you won't lose, be worried about losing test weight um, by, you know, having the, the grain sit on the, in the field to get rained on. Um, also, there's no real yield penalty to that. So you harvest at a higher moisture and, and dry. You, won't, you will not penalize yield. You will perhaps improve um, test weight potentially, but there is a cost associated with that. You know, there's a drying cost. So there, there's pros and cons to that. But pre relatively, um, you know, easy to implement if you have access to that ability to, you know, dry the grain. The other option we to plant earlier, but still after the fly-free date. So we know in wheat there's the Hessian fly-free date that we all are supposed to plant after that particular date, and that is still important because we don't want to have issues with Hessian fly. We, we've probably never seen it here in the state, but if everybody starts planting at the you know earlier and earlier, there's potential we could see this, and we don't want to have problems with this disease. And my colleagues in other states have to deal with this, and I definitely don't want to have to deal with it here in Illinois. It's not something that will be uh, something that we want to add to our list of problems. So we still want to look for that fly-free date, plant afterwards, but on the earlier end of that time frame. So we want to be planting at the fly-free date or you know, two weeks after is considered optimal. So planting earlier will get you a little bit earlier, um, like heading and maturity in the wheat crop, but there is a really relatively small um, effect that you can really take advantage of there. So that, that'll get you, you know, maybe get you a couple days, but there is not a whole lot of room to, to make, push the wheat earlier by manipulating the planting date. So there's a, not too much leeway there, but there, but there is an effect, you know, that does, that can contribute. On the other bullet point, which I'll get into more details on, is selecting earlier wheat varieties. So there, on that, there's a lot of pluses and minuses there. Uh, so earlier wheat varieties, obviously really easy to implement. You can just select an earlier variety, um, you know, when you're making your variety selection decisions. And then that could get you, you know, potentially four or five days, depending on how early that variety is relative to what you're, what you're already growing. So there's potential to gain those, those extra days. Um, 
but there are some challenges with that. So number one, there's gonna be a greater risk of freeze damage. This picture here, um, maybe, you've, you've, maybe you've, you're familiar with this and you've seen it before. Uh, this is a wheat spike with you know, visible freeze damage at harvest where you can see what happened was sterility. So there was in the head, usually towards the tip of the spike, there will be no grain fill in those um, spikelets. Um, it can also happen different, you know, it doesn't have to be the tip of the spike, it can happen on different parts of the spike. Um, that's, that is a visible sign of a freeze damage, and sometimes it can be really severe. You know, sometimes you can have a lot of sterility. Um, some, you know, and I see this practically every year in, in some, you know, one field or another, in one variety or another. So it does happen a lot more than I think we realize. Um, now, another thing is, it's sometimes you don't see the symptoms as obvious as this. You know, sometimes depending on when, what stage of growth the plant was in, when there was a cold snap in the spring, you will see different kinds of effects. So sometimes it might just affect the size of the head or maybe, maybe kill tillers. So there, the damage may not be clearly visible, but it may still be there. Whereas if there wasn't that cold snap, you might have had you know, higher yields. So that is a challenge with the early varieties. They're likely to head earlier. So they will be, if there is happens to be a cold snap in the, um, in the spring, they're gonna have that, that vulnerable time period co coinciding with that colder, those colder temperatures. The other challenge that we have with trying to select early varieties and weigh that, uh, weigh that the earliness with the yield and, and try to make decisions is that we have really imprecise and subjective information on maturity groups. You can look at you know, seed catalogs and they'll give some level, right? They'll they say early, very early, medium early, ultra early. And that's really pretty subjective. The seed company has their way of doing it, but then another seed company will have a, maybe a very different way of trying to assess that. Um, and so if you try to, if you're looking across companies, what one company says is very early, another company might call that medium early or early, right? So there's, it's difficult to compare uh, and it's pretty imprecise. It doesn't tell you, you know, how many days earlier is it, you know, compared to a sp you know, specific variety. So it doesn't give you the maturity date or the date that you'd be harvesting in terms of days. It just gives you a sort of a subjective category. So it's difficult to assess. Um, the other challenge is that early varieties, you know, in especially, you know, thinking about biology and, and just how plants produce yield, they have generally lower yield potential because they have less time to put on biomass and then that's less um, nutrients available to later fill the grain. So these are all the challenges that we have to try to work with. Um, and But there's a lot of progress being made on all these fronts. So in spite of these challenges, still we can use this as a tool. We can still use early wheat varieties and we can work with this and try to improve and, and address these challenges. And that's what I, a lot of the work I do, you know, in my breeding program and my research, we're trying to address these specific challenges to make early wheat varieties something that is more easy to use and you can get more benefits out of it. So just to show you what, what is the progress in this area. So right here on the slide is a graph showing the genetic progress in yield in the University of Illinois breeding program. And this is for the past 20 years. And so for over the past 20 years, we've made a half a bushel increase in yield per year just due to genetic improvement. And this has not affected the days to maturity. So we've actually controlled that days to maturity and improved yield. What that means is that early varieties are getting better. All, all maturity classes are getting better. We're getting that same consistent improvement regardless of the maturity class. So the early varieties, you know, all varieties of today are better than the varieties of yesterday, and that includes our, our early varieties as well. 
And just to acknowledge, my uh, one of my graduate students is the one, uh, Lucas Munaro, is the one who conducted this analysis, looking at 20 years of data, uh, and analyzing and con you know d dissecting the environment from the genetic trends to really get to this number of half a bushel per acre increase per year. And you know our breeding program is one of of many in the eastern region. So there's obviously private companies that are involved in breeding wheat, and they are probably you know, achieving even greater success than we are. So I would say that a half a bushel per acre increase per year is probably a conservative estimate in the industry as a whole. I would say we're, we're probably, you know, other, other breeding programs may be even better than this. Now another thing that we're working on is to better um, evaluate maturity groups. So we have um, started a project where we're going to be looking at all the varieties in the state variety trial. So these are varieties, wheat varieties submitted from different companies that there's probably around 100 varieties uh, of wheat and we're looking at assessing more precisely their maturity and looking not only at their maturity like the state, the date that they reach that particular crop stage, but we're looking at the date when they reach a specific moisture level. So we're, we're going to be determining when do they reach 14% moisture and actually quantifying that time because that's really the most critical value for you know, determining when you're going to be able to plant the double crop soybeans and what's the advantage on the um, subsequent crop. So that's something that we just started. We have you know, the trials in the ground now and this summer we'll be collecting data for the first time and, and publishing that in the state variety trial report. We've also started a project on assessing the spring freeze risk in wheat varieties in that those same wheat varieties in the state variety trial. And what we're going to do is determine when those varieties break dormancy in the spring. You know, because you know wheat goes into dormancy in the winter and then when it when it uh, decides to wake up and start growing it, that is at the point in time where it becomes more vulnerable to cold. So the idea is if, the, if we can identify varieties that stay dormant a little bit longer, they will be able to not be subject to those you know, damaging temperatures. So we will be assessing this and then determining the spring freeze risk on every variety. So ideally, what you should be able to find when you look at the variety trial data is you'll have the spring freeze risk, the date that, that varieties reach 14% moisture and their yield in multiple environments. And with that kind of data, now it becomes a little bit easier to determine what is the best, you know, what's the best variety and weigh those different traits against each other to really determine what would be the best variety for a double crop soybean system. Okay. So going on to the next major it's like action item, you know, that most one of the most important things to make sure that wheat is profitable regardless of double crop soybeans or not is to control scab. Uh, we, you know, we just heard a, a lot about soybean diseases and I feel a little bit fortunate that I think although we, we do have a lot of diseases, scab is really the number one thing that we have to worry about and all the other diseases are, although they, ha they are somewhat important, they're less of a concern, definitely. So scab is number one, it's the one that you know, can just, if you just focus on controlling scab, you will be in really good shape. So I think it's less complicated in a lot of ways in wheat and that you know, we don't have a ton of other really damaging diseases. Scab is the most economically damaging one, and it still is, it has been for a long time. So what is wheat head scab? Well, it is a disease that causes the symptoms I'm showing you here. So there's symptoms on grains as well as on spikes. So if you walk into the field, you can sometimes see these symptoms uh, about, it's a couple weeks after flowering, 
uh, it's usually can be kind of hard to see these symptoms because right after the symptoms become visible, you start to get senescence happening. So the, the time frame when you can actually see the symptoms is pretty short. So you may have this in the field and you don't even notice. Now the other thing is sometimes you don't even have the visual symptoms on the spikes, but you still have damage on the grain. And that actually happened this past year across multiple states. There were many cases where there was absolutely no visual symptoms and everyone saw, oh, there's zero scab. And then you look at the grain and there was actually damage and, and um, vomitoxin. And so the grain damage is really what we are most concerned about because that is affecting the value of the grain. And what the pathogen does is it produces a toxin called vomitoxin, which is also, you know, scientific name is deoxynevalanol, or DON. And that is what the pathogen uses to infect. So it is using this toxin to get in to the plant, and it is actually producing the toxin, and that's accumulating in the grains. You can probably see the pic, you know, in the picture, there's these white, you know, white bleached grains, and those are gonna have a lot of vomitoxin. Some of the grains that look healthy may also have vomitoxin. So it's a tricky disease, uh, and it's, you know, it, it can be really damaging because this, there's a lot of penalties, there's a lot of discounts that are applied, you know, when these, when the grain is looking as bad as this, especially, and even when it has some uh, vomitoxin. So just looking at this now, putting into more precise uh, numbers or values on what the importance of vomitoxin and also to mention that scab affects test weight as well. So it will also reduce test weight and it will also produce vomitoxin. This is kind of a double whammy when it comes to reducing grain quality. So here in this, this is just a graph. I took some data from a bunch of different grain elevators and looked at the discount schedules and averaged them and come up with a general pattern of you know what is the what's the general discount for vomitoxin and test weight um, in terms of dollars per bushel? Basically, you lose 0 0.25 dollars, 25 cents per bushel for every one part per million increase in vomitoxin beyond two parts per million. So there's a lot of variation depending on where you're going to sell the grain to, but that's on average, and uh, you basically have a you know, kind of a two parts per million grace period. Beyond that, you start to get into some pretty heavy discounts. With test weight, it's roughly similar, about 25 cents, um, uh, 25 cents per bushel every one pound decrease in test weight beyond 56 pounds per bushel. So you have a, you know, between you know, 58 is the target, uh, and then you get, there's some slight discounting that can occur if it's less than 58, but really once you start getting 56 and below, um, then you start to get into some heavy discounts. So this, if you have a bad issue with scab, or even a, an average scab year, if you left, if you just, let's say you did it, try to control it, and conditions were just typically favorable for scab as it is here, very common here in Illinois, you would, probably see discounts. So it's it's not that difficult to start to get into uh, issues with vomitoxin. The past couple of years has been really um, low scab years. We've been, it's been fantastic, but that's not typical. You know, typically Illinois has like very, very favorable conditions for scab. Also um, with minimal tillage that also makes scab a lot more um, risk, you know, there's a higher risk of getting scab. Uh, and so this is not going away. Now the one advantage that we have compared to a lot of other diseases is that we don't really see much change in the pathogen. It's not really evolving to overcome the resistance that we have built through breeding. So that is one, like a silver lining with this pathogen. Uh, so controlling scab, basically two things that we can do. Select varieties that are at least moderately resistant and spray an effective fungicide at flowering. And I would, 
I'd say both are really needed for the best control. So they have an additive effect. If you, um, so let's say your, your level of scab is here. If you spray, you can bring that down. If you have a resistant variety, you can bring that down further. So it's not that, oh, I've sprayed, now I don't need resistance. That's not, that's not the right way to, to approach it. You can spray and still get plenty of scab. Or you can have a moderately resistant variety that's not sprayed, still get plenty of scab. But when you put two together, you can really get good control. And so that's what is, that is what we recommend. Now, when it comes to choosing scab resistant varieties, there's some things to keep in mind. No varieties are immune. That's why we still recommend spraying a fungicide. Because no varieties are immune, we shy away from calling varieties resistant because we don't want to send the message that, oh, this is a, you know, resistant, so I don't need to worry about it. Um, so typically, we'll give them a moderately resistant rating and consider that a very good uh, level of scab resistant. In rare cases, we may call a variety resistant if it really is, you know, an outlier and, and having very high levels of resistant, but still, there's no immunity. And uh, all the varieties that are entered in the state official state variety trial are evaluated for scab, and we evaluate um, in a in a misted and inoculated trial. We also we take the grain samples and look at drain quality, and we also get the, the vomitoxin on every single sample. So the data that we publish is based on the vomitoxin, not you know just how nice it looked in the field, but really the vomitoxin level. And if you look at this um, website here where the QR code is pointing you to, you can get all those results on, on those varieties and get a nice objective, sorry, a nice um, objective evaluation of all the varieties that are available. And I really liked how um, Jason Bond put up some some information that seed companies provide, and it made me remember to tell you that the information that seed company for companies provide is useful, and the companies, they do know a lot about the products they sell, but it's, a, it's difficult sometimes to know what exactly they're considering as resistant or moderately resistant. Sometimes when I look at the catalogs, I'm like, well, everything is good. That's impossible. Not everything is good, so you have to be, a little bit critical and dig in and look at these these data because not everything is excellent. You know, it's, it's just it's just you know keep that in mind. You know, you want to look at this data and decide for yourself. So, although I said not everything is excellent, there are a lot of excellent varieties out there. So, make sure you take a look at the at the information and um, and and see what, what level of resistance you know, maybe your variety has or um, use that to help you guide decision making. Because there are a lot of good options and a lot more now than there ever has been. And just like I showed you about trends in yield due to breeding, we see similar success in scab resistance. So here, this is a, a graph showing improvements in resistance to scab over time. This is the level of vomitoxin in parts per million over the past 20 years, just is just due to breeding, so controlling for any change in environment. And we are seeing a, a 0.1 parts per million reduction in vomitoxin per year, just based on the genetics. So it's kind of a slow improvement, but it's steady. So if we just continue to, to keep going in this direction, we'll, and the pathogen luckily is not rapidly evolving so far, hopefully it stays that way, so we will hopefully you know, get to the point where we're more and more of the varieties available are, are you know, resistant or, you know, very resistant. And scab resistant varieties are, you know, better now than they ever have been. So if you've ever had experience before and didn't like, you know, the, the, what was available uh, in terms of scab resistance, it's worth taking a second look because there's a lot of improvements that have been made. Okay, and, and fungicides, it's important to mention because we do need both. Um, the three that are recommended are 
Moravis Ace, Prosaro, and Caramba. Moravis Ace is the most, um, probably the most popular one now, one of the newer um, chemicals that provides really good control. But the other, I mean, all three of these are good, so these are all recommended. The timing is really critical, and that can be really difficult to achieve because you know not every single not every single plant in a field is at the exact same developmental stage. So, uh, you know, controlling scab and applying fungicide at this optimal timing, which is at anthesis, that can be difficult. But at you know at the very you have to try the best you can to get that timing at early anthesis. So that's I put this red box here. That's when the anthers just start to shed. So you should see very early anthesis. If it's to the point where you've now, you know, you see anthers and they're are white, it's a little bit too late, but you really want to be trying to get it at that point. There is some um, some data from I think Syngenta that shows that Moravis Ace is effective at the you know at longer in a longer window of time for application. And that is true to some extent. There is, I think, I, I can't remember if it's like you can spray it a little bit earlier or a little bit later. That's what the company says. But when you look at data where people have tested this over many, many environments, um, they, they've shown that if you really want to achieve the best control, this is still the best application window, that right at early anthesis. So, you still you still need to you know try to apply at this time, regardless of you know, you know what what new product says. Okay, this one can be applied later or earlier. Don't rely on that. You know that might help you if you you know if you're late or early for whatever reason, but you still want to be doing it at that early anthesis stage. Okay. So the last thing is of course improving yield. And you know, there's a lot that we could talk about there, and um, I'm just gonna go through just a couple things that I think are important. There's, but there's, there's a huge, you know, number of things we could get into, and probably spend an entire day on that. But um, number one, I think you know, nutrients recommended and at proper times. I, oftentimes, I think that you know, if I see, if you see a field that doesn't look as good as it should be. I think a lot of times it has to do with the timing of the nitrogen in the spring. Uh, so we want to have nitrogen applied in the fall and at spring at that proper time right at jointing. And that can be difficult to achieve, but that's really crucial. And fungicides and herbicides in the spring, um, narrow row spacing, so avoiding wider rows, going, you know, keeping, staying with the seven and a half inch row spacing as opposed to 15 inches, which some people are trying out. Uh, it's still better to do the narrower row spacing. Planting within two weeks of the fly-free date and not too much later than that. You know, once you start getting later, you start to get poorer stands and, and that can impact the yield. Seeding rates, at least, you know, 1.2 million seeds per acre. That's um, the economic optimum for wheat, but some companies are recommending more than there, I, you know, that may, there may be some benefit to that, but 1.2 million is still kind of the recommended rate. And of course, commercial seed of the best varieties. You definitely want to be investing in that because it does pay off. And then timely harvest, um, you know, getting that wheat out as harvested as soon as possible because of course that benefits not only the quality and the yield of the wheat crop, but also the double crop soybean yield to get those soybeans planted sooner. And again, uh, when you want to select the best wheat varieties, we have this great resource that the University of Illinois provides, which is the official state variety trial. And the data is published every year, available on the website. And so that includes information on yield. The companies provide information on things like maturity group and some other characteristics, like if it's bearded, non-bearded, and all these other, um, all this other information. We also collect data on scab resistance and other traits like height, and we're adding to this now with the spring freeze risk and the day that they reach you know, 14% moisture. 
And I encourage you to get and look at this information. And it can be a little bit daunting because it's there are pages and pages of tables. And that's something I hope to improve in the future is make it a little bit more digestible. But you know, I recommend just honing in, considering the traits, yield, scab resistance, maturity, and test weight. Just hone in on that. Um, and it, I think it helps to look at a variety you're familiar with and use that as a reference for comparison. So if, you, if there's something that you're familiar with, you've you know, grown it already, look at that one and see, okay, what's better than this in terms of yield or what's better than this in terms of scab resistance? And that's a good way to start. And then there is uh, some value in also looking at previous year's data, not just the current year, because um, those, there is a large year effect, you know, things can change in rank across years, and so it's good to look at multiple years. And then keep in mind that not all varieties available are tested in that trial. So it's only a, you know, a proportion of actually what's available. So if you don't see what's, you know, some company or variety that you're interested in, it just may not be available, and that's, you know, for whatever reason, that doesn't mean it's a bad variety. And then, you know, just in general, if you wanna, you know, just generally, there's something you can, one thing you can remember from this talk is that newer varieties are gonna be better than older ones on average. And so there's a lot of value in updating and staying up to date on, on the wheat genetics and, and switching to newer varieties. And, you know, this is on average, of course. And then again, want to you know, reemphasize that we're gonna be providing more information and making this, um, our variety trial data more useful for, especially for wheat and double crop soybeans together. And that's why we are providing this data on when dormancy is being released. And we'll, and we'll be summarizing that in, um, in the uh, variety testing uh, data. And then when the date when they varieties reach 14% moisture. So that's thanks to funding by the Illinois Soybean Association that we're able to collect. This data is not really easy to collect, so that's why it hasn't been done in the past. And so we're actually, this is gonna be the first year that we're even doing this, or probably anybody has done this. <laughs> so we're kind of in uncharted uh, territory, but um, I'm pretty excited because I like a challenge. I like to be able to try to measure things that people say is really hard to measure. So. Um, looking forward to be able to present those, these results in future meetings. So to summarize, just the key points here that you know, decisions made for wheat influence profitability of the wheat double crop soybean system as a whole. Um, you wanna aim for earlier maturity, better scab control, and higher yield. So that's sometimes hard to achieve all those things at the same time, especially when there are trade-offs, but more data is useful to be able to try to weigh those uh, against each other. And variety selection decisions are really key and something that I think is worth revisiting every year and, and spending time doing it. Last, I, I wanna make an announcement to uh, an upcoming event, which is the Illinois Wheat Association's Winter Double Crop Farmers Forum, which is right around here in Mount Vernon. And there'll be an entire day talking about different aspects of wheat management and you know, focusing in on how do we make it better? Um, how do we improve wheat double crop soybeans together? And then I'd like to acknowledge all the people and the people that, you know, funding agencies that help support you know, what I do and our, our goals at the University of Illinois. So thank you and I hope I can take questions. Oh, already, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's something that is very well known that if the more um, corn residue that is in the field on the surface, that's Gonna be that's gonna be higher disease pressure for scab. Um, now I've seen a lot of residue on even in soybean. If you're following soybeans, you're still gonna potentially have a lot of corn residue. So, you know, I tend to not be too concerned about. You know, they recommend okay, you're not supposed to plant wheat after corn, but 
I think in practice, I, I think that the, the scab is there. You know, it's in the environment, it's in the atmosphere, it's really hard to avoid it. So I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, you know, I, 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 I shouldn't recommend planting wheat after corn, but I don't think it's as big of a deal as we, we think it is. Yeah, I hope that made sense. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I uh, just want to thank uh, Jessica for coming here. She traveled down south, and many of you may not be as familiar with her, but this is your chance, not to put her on the spot, but we have a lot of programs, and now that we have a lot more in-person programs since COVID happened, this is your chance to let her know what are your issues, what are things that are concerning you on your farm, or if you're a crop consultant, what are the things that you're majorly dealing with with your clients and how maybe that she can help you? And that's another thing that I feel like the Illinois Soybean Association has been helping to provide um, not only just outreach, but also availability of these researchers now. Um, some, a lot are new and we're welcoming you uh, to, to the state um, with the past couple of years. And so they're really not only getting to know the whole state, but also farmers within the state and their concerns. So um, with that, I would like to thank all the presenters this morning. Thank you to you all for attending this Better Beans event. Uh, we want to make sure that we also thank our sponsors, who is the Soil and Water Outcomes Fund. And our next Better Beans will be next Thursday. We will be headed north um, to Deer Grove uh, on the road with the Bean Mobile. Uh, so watch us on, uh, you know, social media. Uh, we want to conclude this meeting series with the Soybean Summit. I know a lot of you mentioned that to, to me that you would maybe like to go if you can't go. I know there's a lot of meetings going on. Um, again, these med meetings will all be on YouTube, uh, broadcasted live, thanks to the Miss Kelsey Litchfield. And they will also be recorded and archived basically on our website on lsoyadvisor.com. So don't worry, you won't miss anything. Uh, the other important thing that I wanna talk about is to please, after this program, um, if we do have your email, you will probably receive an evaluation form for this program today, today's event. We really do value your participation in this. We really do look at all these forms um, and feedback especially when it's me up here presenting, I make sure to look at it, that as well. Um, there's also an opportunity for you to put down things that you wanna learn more about. And so we really do take a look at that as well. And so please make sure you um, participate and give us some feedback, right, Kelly? We like your feedback. And what we do, we use this feedback um, to <laughs> make our programs better each year. And now that I put Kelly on the spot, which is fun to do, um, I would like to recognize Soy Envoys this year. So Kelly, if you'd stand up. Kelly Robertson has been one of our Soy Envoys. These are experts out in their field that give their time uh, to volunteer for the Illinois Soybean Association by doing various things like helping contribute information to our blog, and that may be written, it could also be a video, it can be a podcast, which we found out Kelly loves to podcast, which is, we're really excited about that. Um, and then we also have um, a new uh, thing that's happening on our website that is uh, basically people going out while they're already out in the field, and people like Kelly will report live from the field telling us what's going on um, scouting-wise, and that's also on lsoyadvisor.com. And then we use that information to help not only for me to know what's going on around the state, because we all can't be everywhere at the same time, but we also use that 
to help with what do we need to talk about at programs like this, as well as maybe future research that's funded by Illinois Soybean Association. So with that, um, I would again encourage you if you want to learn more about anything that we've talked about or uh, topics throughout that happened in the, the last growing season, please go to lsoyadvisor.com. This is where all the latest agronomic advice is and as well as programming to enhance not only profitability but also sustainability. Um, all of this valuable content is accessible to you for free and 24 seven. So again, don't forget to follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook at Elsoy Advisor for updates. Um, we are, uh, how are we doing on t with lunch? I, Steven? Okay, so he's checking on lunch, so we're getting ready. Do not leave. We have plenty of food that we would like you to partake in um, here as we conclude the program. Um, and we also want to, again, give you opportunities to, to network and just engage in conversations with each other, but more importantly, our agronomy team. Um, and then, uh, last reminder, we have five minutes until lunch. Um, so you can take a little break before lunch is ready. And one last reminder, if you are a certified crop advisor and you need your CEUs, go ahead and make sure you go out and scan the form or write your, your name down. And with that, if you have any other questions, just let me know. Thank you.